and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Hello, Dave Warnicky. Hello, Matt Stewart. Hi, Jess Perkins, and hello to David Warnicky. Great to be here with a man who's known me for many years and still doesn't know my name. <laughs> Sorry, can you just say it one more time? Varnake. Varnake. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, David Varnake. David Varnake. <laughs> so good to be here with you, David Varnake. <laughs> hey, now we're all here and friends and know each other's names. Yes. Jess Parkins, can I please ask you uh, to explain what this show is? It would be my absolute pleasure. What this show is, is it's a rockin' good time. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's the tagline. The three of us take it in turns reporting on a topic usually suggested by a listener. We go away, we research that topic, we bring it back, we tell you, the listener, all about it, and us, our co-hosts, all about it. You listen politely, listeners, uh, maybe <laughs> laughing along. Co-hosts, really more of a... Um, uh, interrupting, heckling kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah. We have some fun, we have some laughs, we learn some facts, we live, laugh, love. Borderline obnoxious. Yeah, borderline though, but like... But always on the right side of that line. Exactly, and it's kind of like the fun obnoxious rather than the... Uh, you know, it's sort of like... Usually. When you, I mean, there was the Irish dancing episode, which people talk about still. Yeah. I don't remember it being so brutal, but apparently people listen to it and they're weeping by the end because Dave has yeah. been such... A real mean man. He's been a real mean man. <laughs> that Sorry, was me. Wrong. I was going to say the C word, but I changed it to a real mean man. And I think they're interchangeable. Yeah, I think I still got the 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 s- hatred in your yeah. voice. A real Clarence Hunt. Honestly, I'm more <laughs> offended. Mean man? Mean man. What do you mean by that? I don't think you're a mean man. I just haven't listened back to it ever again. Hey, sorry about that. I left the hatred on that episode. Now, I love everything. <laughs> River dance, I love it. Love it. It's fun. Musicals, I love them. <laughs> and I also love this topic. It is my turn to report on. We will start with a question. And my question to both of you is, you have no idea what this topic is, which saint Ooh. is known as... La Pucelle, or the Maid of Olion. This is good because you're asking the two people who uh, went to Catholic school. Yeah, definitely spent a lot of time focusing on saints. Who was your confirmation saint? Uh, Elizabeth. I went with Paul. Did you go with Paul because that's your dad's name? Yes, I did. Elizabeth is my mum's middle name, and uh, I already have mum's name as my middle name, so I wanted her entire name in my oh, name. Oh, that's sick. Oh, that's funny. And my brother, Michael, chose Michael. Yes. <laughs> so he wouldn't forget it. Michael Michael. Yeah, he's Michael John Michael. Chad Michael Michaels. Is that any? Is that, some, is that somebody? Is that your brother? <laughs> <laughs> My brother's Chad Michael Michaels. Pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's exactly. I'm like, oh, as as like a. It felt like a some sort of an homage to my dad. Yeah. So what? I don't even know. So he's I'm a so- classic uh, Saint Paul. He's the one who was a sinner named Saul, and then he got blinded on the road to. Gethsemane? I've no idea. Um, um, this is all right in the back wow. of my brain. I might be saying some of that wrong. Uh, and that was God blinding him. And he that day he became Paul. Changed his name because he was going to be he was good now. Wow. Hey, thanks so much for blinding me. I um, <laughs> really appreciate yeah. it. God works in mysterious ways. Never liked the name Saul. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. What did Elizabeth do? No idea. Now, <laughs> is, is it Paul or Elizabeth? Oh, no, you haven't happened upon the name yet. So, it's La Pucelle or the Maid of Orléans. Or oh, the Maid. So, French? It's oh, a French, come on. It's a famous mm. French oh, is maid. It, is it maid. Is it Maid? Oh, Maid Marion. Yeah, no. <laughs> not Maid Marion. Is it Joan of Arc? It is Joan oh, of Arc. Yes! Sick. Congratulations. <gasps> you, I got one. You went from, like, hating me for not having any idea to suddenly, I know it. Well, I was like, French. <laughs> Who's right. French. The other one, the French, uh, was the the kid, I think we talked about recently, the kids who saw maybe Mary and then people, crowds would come to watch them looking at Mary appear to them and then the water has become holy and now people, you can go visit that city and they sell so much Jesus merch. It's uh, exactly how I'm sure <laughs> Jesus would have wanted it. As intended. There's like jugs in the shape of Jesus. And, it's all of, and you go fill up your jugs of Jesus jugs with the holy water. And, right. and people go there to cure their cancer. And I have a funny feeling it doesn't work. But Interesting. It's always been about that's the merch. That's Lords or Lourdes or something. Are you allowed to bring that back into the country? Ah. Oh. You know, what are oh, the customs rules? Bring the water back. Yeah, it depends. I suppose it depends on how many mills it is. And couldn't you take that take that jug to Seven Eleven Day and fill it up with yeah. as much Slurpee as you want? Is that what Jesus would have wanted? <laughs> Add that to the holy water and slurp it down. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that'll, yeah. that'll cure everything. That's the best tasting holy water you'll ever find. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it depends on what flavour you get, <laughs> yeah, if you like true. that flavour. Like yeah. frozen raspberry, yes, please. I take sacrilege. Yeah. <laughs> Sacrilicious. <laughs> uh, this topic has been voted on by the Patreon supporters. I put out uh, four topics in this one. Uh, All one? Saints? Uh, not All Saints. Though. Sorry, I'll just name my favourite band. <laughs> I prefer Atomic Kitten. <laughs> <laughs> kitten. Uh, no, I put out uh, four uh, different ladies from different centuries, all very famous for very different things. And Joan of Arc won in a bit of a landslide. Oh. And it's been suggested by three people, so thank you to Sarabi from Ontario, Marissa from London, Toby Gall from London, and Cade Frazier from Minneapolis. Amazing. I'm ah, surprised it hasn't been suggested by more people. Me too, to be honest. And to be fair, I obviously know the name Joan of Arc. I think I know a few basics, but I don't know the whole story. Matt, how are you, how are you feeling? You're an I, expert? I reckon I'd know more than that. I know... Because of The Simpsons? Uh, yeah. The Leonard Cohen song. Okay. He talks about fire, and I think that's involved. Probably late in her story. Um, and she was... I know she died pretty young. And she was in an army, and she maybe led an army. A lot of spoilers Spoiler here. of, the, of yeah. the year here. Yeah, I mean, edit all that out. <laughs> you are ruining everything. <laughs> Sorry. But I mean, I've left some gaps to fill. <laughs> I believe this woman from five or six hundred years ago is dead. <laughs> Dave, un- Dave Selly, no more gaps will fill in the rest. I will attempt oh my to gosh, do that. Should we call Dave Selly? Selly? I like that. Selly. a nickname, Selly's? Because. You're pretty desperate for a nickname, so I'd be taking anything if I were you. You're filling in the gaps. Appreciate that. And you do do that every time we're like, Dave, what's that thing called? And you know. You also, the gaps. I'm very handy on the tools. <laughs> yeah. You're a bit of yes. a tool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's what I meant. Sorry, that is what I meant. You are very handy on the tools. <laughs> if the tools is, I don't know, Google? Do, yeah. That's a dictionary. I was say yeah, a dictionary. I was Calculator. Say, I was going to say a knife and fork, but even then I can't <laughs> operate it properly. No. Abacus. Spoon. He's all right with the spoon. Oh, great with the spoon. Our so. little boy. You call him his spoon beans. man. <laughs> Um, I one of my first spoons? one of my first ever <laughs> nicknames was Spoony, given to me by my uh, bass guitar teacher because God, this is embarrassing. Why to bring it up? I um I wore a cha- of course I wore a chain on my wallet at the yes, time, two thousand and three, and I was a, a bit of a punk rocker. And uh, on the in the, cha- in the sort of Avril Lavigne style, exactly. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> yes, again, Matt with the corrections, absolutely <laughs> nailing it. And um, uh, I had some padlocks on. On the chain. Sure. You're a real skater boy. <laughs> and I also... <laughs> you said, see you later, boy. And I was, was not an good enough for, for some her. reason. I was yeah. not good enough for her. And I... Um, <laughs> so the padlock's on the chain. And I also had uh, a set of measuring spoons. Why? Because one time <laughs> I bought a tub of ice cream to, t- to sneak into Hoyt <laughs> Cinema at Eastland. And for some reason I couldn't find anywhere that sold cutlery. And we couldn't find spoons. So I bought just a, some measuring, measuring spoons. spoons. And then I put them on my, my uh, chain and then my uh, guitar teacher, Ben, said, I'm going to call you Spoony. <laughs> Spoony sucks. Spoons would have been better, I reckon. Spoons. Spoony. Ah, oh, Spoony's all right. Spoon. So, but also measuring, sp- I mean, supermarkets have cutlery. Um, probably where you got the ice cream. But the beauty of yes. measuring spoons, yeah. they can't, they'd <laughs> come on a ring and they can exactly. link on the yeah, chain. Yeah, but they're like a weird shape. Yeah, like I've got the big one and then my friends have a, an increasingly smaller <laughs> yeah. amount of ice cream. Like perfect. You, you kind of want somewhere in the middle. You maybe want like, I'm thinking, oh, you want like quarter of a cup at most because they're like a, they can be quite deep. It's going to yeah. be annoying to eat out of. They look, well, they're more like an ice cream scoop. So yeah, but then you, you need another. You don't eat out of the ice cream <laughs> scoop. You scoop it into a bowl or into a cone. You don't eat out of the ice cream <laughs> scoop. <laughs> oh, and sticking with the theme of Christianity, apologies to Ben all those years ago who uh, was in a Christian band and gave me an album of his band if I promised that I would go and see the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, at the cinema. Oh my I God. took the CD and I did not see the movie. <laughs> he was trying to bribe one of his students to go see The Passions yeah. of the Christ. Did he think Mel Gibson would convert you? <laughs> I think that that was his hope. Wow. Wow. That sounds like you had a close call. <laughs> I got a free CD. Close Call with Christ, which would have been the name of your first Christian album. Yeah. Instead, I released the Weed Hornet EP. <laughs> anyway, okay, so Joan of Arc, to start this story, we have to talk about the Hundred Years' War. How long did be- that go for? Well, that's my question for you. Fought between England and France. How long do you think it actually went for? Uh, it's some. It's either way more or way less. I'm going to say 64 years, 69 years. <laughs> nice. I'm going to say 95. Five. Five. 
I wanted to say four. You reckon that they That's had a cute. they had a sixty nine year war and they didn't call it the sixty nine year war. They called it the war for two. <laughs> <laughs> England and France coming together at last. <laughs> it was 116 years. Oh, come on. Which, honestly, Jess, uh, I thought that you would like that because uh, they've taken that number and rounded it down to 100. Yeah, actually, I don't. <sighs> but I think Jess, I don't want to speak for Jess, but I will speak for Jess. I think she would have preferred if they just stopped the war right. 100 years. Yeah, that yeah, would have okay. been better for, I think, everyone, not just me. I don't think there's many people you. that were involved in that war that were like, oh, we've been going more. for 100 years, but I'm not ready to finish, <laughs> you know? I'm bad at goodbyes. Yeah. <laughs> and it should be known that uh, historians have since taken that number and rounded it down to 100. At the time, okay. they weren't referring. Imagine starting it being like, we're starting the 100 mm. years yeah. war. Or you get to 99 and you're like, you know what, let's go just one more. Round it on. up. Let's do it. That would be me as a, um, as a, as a leader going, I know things – are wrapping up, but if we could just hold on, then we do a hundred. Yeah. Then we have a party, and then you go one day over. You're like, all right, we've got to go another ten years. We've got to Let's go do this. Time. I'm so sorry. Sorry, everyone. If we had a ninety-nine year war, I'd call it the Barbara Featon Fe- Felden Felden War. She played ninety-nine anyway. Agent, Agent ninety-nine. <laughs> Dave. Bit of a get smart I joke felt, there. I you really felt like we got right into the uh, episode this week and then have just faffed for I 10 know, minutes. Yeah. Like, we introduced the what this show is uh, at the 30 second mark. Whoa. And we're now 11 minutes in. Fuck. All right. Sorry. Uh, taking place between 1357 and 1453, the Hundred Year War was a series of conflicts fought between England and France involving several disputes, a big one of which was the question of the legitimate succession to the French crown ah. multiple people claiming that hey i'm the king was louis one of them no louis in this story what what no louis no louis no wow okay dave sorry everyone i don't know any other french names so <laughs> no, any napoleons not yet no <laughs> what what you, what where? remind me of these years again 1357 to 1453 Fuck, it is a long time ago isn't it this is a long time ago yes I think they had mix masters back then. Yep, they also had mix master Mike from the Beastie Boys. He was yeah, <laughs> he's an old soul. He's an old man. Uh, there was a series of truces, but overall, it lasted for five generations of kings from the two sides who were fighting for the throne of the largest kingdom in Western Europe. And it was a bitter conflict with both sides hating each other's guts, and the conflict permanently changed warfare in Europe. Uh, because it went for so long, it is hard to summarise, but it all began principally because King Edward III of England and King Philip VI of France escalated a dispute that became a battle for the French crown. When King Charles IV of France died in 1328, the nearest male relative was his nephew, King Edward III of England. Oh, that's good. I thought it was going to be uh, Ralph of uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is, that's a couple of years later. Okay. Uh, but the French nobility preferred Charles's cousin Philip, and they were both like, "I'm the king." But the the but the English king is already king. Yeah, king of England. So give it to someone else. Yeah. You, got the, you got England. Give him a go. Give someone else a go. Oh, I got to be king of both, are you? Wait, so that fucking rude. Does that mean that they would have brought the two kingdoms together? Yes. Wow. And, that's, what, and wow. that's basically what the English are pushing for for this hundred years. Uh, they both wanted the top job and it kicked off all the fighting. And after several decades of relative peace, the English resumed the war in 1415. Uh, so I've skipped over a lot, but that's the start of why it kicked yeah. off. Then there's a few other disputes, but, but then we got a bit of peace. But then the English resumed the war in 1415 amid the failure of negotiations with the French. By this time, they were led, this is England, by King Henry V, who himself was a great warrior and led his army at a very famous battle, the Battle of Argincourt. Ah, yes. Very famous battle. Yeah, I love that one. Very. Be my top three battles, I reckon. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Well, I wonder if the other two are coming up because it took place in northern France on the 25th of October, 1415, which is St. Crispin Day. Ah, Krispy Kreme. Ah, St. Crispin (laughs) Day. (laughs) (laughs) Tis replied, Anne Helga. Uh, the same day on which other famous battles have taken place, including the Charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War in 1854, which I... Great song. We'll definitely do a report on one Is day. It? Is that a song? Or a great battle? 
Great charge. Oh, it's great a, charge. There's a, there's a famous poem. Great poem. poem. Great, of, great poem. poem. I believe it's a bit of Tennyson. Uh, and great poet. That took <laughs> <laughs> great poet. Great poet. Uh, also taking place on that day was the, is the Battle of Late, the Battle of Late Golf in 1944. Which oh, is I got to make your tea off time. <laughs> considered to be the largest <laughs> naval battle of World War Two, possibly the largest naval battle ever. Wow. So all three of these things took place on the same day, which is pretty cool. Same day. Well, all on St. Crispin Day. St. Crispin Day. (laughs) Celebrating uh, Crispin Glover's performance in Back to the Future 1. Great work. I prefer to celebrate his work in Charlie's Angels. Mm. Also great work. Mm. In which he hated the dialogue so much because it sucked. But he said, I'm actually just going to play this character quiet. (laughs) This character is not going to speak. Love it. And he doesn't. (laughs) Wow. That's a beautiful choice. That is a weak director. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh, Yeah, sure. No worries. All right. That's all right. Uh, Yeah, let's not worry about it. Uh, Shakespeare also immortalized the war. This is Argencourt. In the St. Crispin's Day speech in his play, Henry V, where the title character pumps up his men who are vastly outnumbered the night before the battle. And the title character is... Henry V. Oh, okay. Also known as Henry V. Henry V. Yeah. V for victory. Uh, they won. Oh, spoilers. Uh, well, it's such a great speech. Uh, just a couple of the lines here. He says... the f- So they're outnumbered. He says, The fewer men, the greater share of honour. Ooh. Uh, That's badass. That is badass. I like that. And if it is a sin to covet honour, then I am... The most offending soul alive. Oh. Okay, I'm proud of it, which is another sin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. And that's where the phrase band of brothers comes from. Oh. Ah, which is, went on to be a Dire Straits album. Is it? <laughs> is that a thing? It's a movie? Yeah, My so movie. Like an HBO s- a series. HBO series. Brothers in it's Arms. Brothers in the, Arms, yeah. Is the Dire Straits <laughs> album. Uh, but also in this speech, he says, we three. Sultans of Swing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, honestly, very influential. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dire Straits joke did not know I had that in me. Uh, anyway, so it's just a cool speech. Anyway, in the play, <laughs> in the play, Henry V pumps them up. Whether he did that or not, we're not sure. But he did win the Battle of Argencourt, which resulted in an unexpected English victory against the much larger French army and boosted English morale and prestige and resulted in a crippling of France and started a new period of English dominance in the war. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Well done, Band of Brothers. Uh, Henry V then conquered Normandy in 1417 to 1418 and then attempted to have himself crowned as the future king of France by the Treaty of Troyes. Definitely saying that wrong. Which was an agreement that stated that Henry would become king of France when the current king, Charles VI, died. Okay, and then Charles VI is like, easy, I just never die. (laughs) Yeah, I'll live forever. (laughs) Which, honestly, uh, he's known as the Mad King because of his serious mental illness and psychotic episodes that plagued him. So he probably believed that. (laughs) Easy peasy. It's a funny deal to make. It's like, they just fought us for control of stuff why would we trust yeah that's right now when i die you can have it yeah why would you trust that and and he did henry then married king charles daughter catherine de valois he was like all right i'll marry your daughter and then in like five to ten years when you've you've all right fine i'll marry your daughter i'll be king she'll be queen and and i'll be king of both places that was the plan so it was agreed that henry would inherit the throne and he probably would have and it probably would have possibly ended i say probably possibly Ended the entire Hundred Years' War if okay. something major didn't happen. Okay. He died. Oh, that's major. Would you, yeah, I'd call that. I'd call that relatively major in his life. In his life, well, that's yeah. right. Yeah, for somebody else that day, they were having a great day. Yeah, you know, someone on the other side of the planet, it was the best day of their life. You know, that's, isn't that crazy? <laughs> yes. Right now. T- oh right my. now, we're sitting in my living room. Oh it's my a God, nice day. It. But somewhere, some someone is having the worst day of their someone life. Someone sitting in the living room having a shit one. Yeah. Having a terrible time. It's probably no blue skies for them. Sitting there with their two enemies. <gasps> Unlike us, two friends we're sitting with right here. What if I told you that I was the one sitting in the living room with two enemies? <laughs> That's not possible, Dave. <laughs> You're here with us. Dave, what, what have you got against the pot plants? Yeah. I've, I've really tried to in- you, incorporate You hate these greenery. monsteras? Is that? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Great work. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great work. I thought you were talking gibberish. I got no, I got that from a, a comic book. A comic 
you should follow on Instagram. It's, I forget what it's called, but it's about like it's all about heads, heads, thoughts, and stuff. Okay. And they had like dressing up your pot plants for Halloween, and it said like <laughs> Frankenstein's monstera. Ah, oh, that's know. good. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm like, oh, that's what those that's things what that are. One is. That is a pun. <gasps> that's a pun. Oh my that's god, a pun. we finally got there. Finally, and it, finally a practical example in your life. <laughs> So, uh, Henry V died suddenly of dysentery before he could become king of France. Oh, dysentery is not a good way to go. Oh, no. You're shitting yourself. Shitting yourself in a trench. Shitting yeah. yourself to death <laughs> in a trench. Very good. Uh, and his heir was his son, Henry VI, who was crowned king of England at just nine months of age. What? Whoa. A nine-month-old king. And we don't have a cartoon <laughs> series about that? Baby king. Are you kidding me? That's we what? have boss baby, but not king oh, baby? The original boss baby. That's Fun and you know a lot of pressure. I imagine, a kid. yeah. Do they are they taking orders from the baby? Yeah, they are. Because <laughs> isn't isn't the idea that it's a divine thing? It's coming from God. Yes. So they'd be like, oh, we got to do what this baby says, well, well, and the baby wants num num. <laughs> so that's baby what needs tummy time. <laughs> tummy so time, I guess. everyone. Tummy, tummy time. time for all. <laughs> Uh, while still a child, several others ruled for him as a regency council. So he had like a team of advisors, a lot of relatives. They were the ones giving him skin members. on skin contact. Very important <laughs> yeah, yeah. in those early early days. <laughs> That's right. That's actually when he was a teenager. They were still doing. It. That's where the saying uh, "You rule" comes from because he was. It's what he said to them. He said, "You guys rule," and then that sort of caught on. That's the power of a king. Yeah. Well. Uh, it's gone out of fashion now, but big yeah. in the 90s. It peaked in the 90s, but it started in the 1400s. That's right. It took 500 years to peak. It was a slow curve up. Yeah. Now, a, a rapid dip down. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Really you hardly off. ever hear anyone say that things rule. Yeah. Oh, let's bring it back. Bring I'm, it back. I'm bringing it back. Uh, yeah. Dave, that rules. Thank you. <laughs> Jackson Bailey on from Sands Pants Radio is still a big user of that rules. That rules. He's been. I feel like Jackson that can ca- pull that off. Yeah, only Jackson. Yeah, but I, I reckon maybe in I strength in numbers we can. I'll try, but I'm you know no promises. You know, not quite that level of cool. You know what? You trying would rule. <laughs> oh, I hated that. <laughs> and that rules. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Wow, the graph's going up and down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know that's progress. So he's a baby king. Other people were ruling for him, making his decisions. He properly inherited the crown at the age of 16 in 1437. Still young, hey. And Still young, hi. Hi. And would it surprise <laughs> you that he was a terrible king? That does surprise me. I think I would have been an excellent <laughs> ruler at 16. I was making good choices. i got to say, loving this report on Joan of Arc. Yeah. Mate, this is all context. That's what I mean. I love context. <laughs> uh, I so think context rules. He was a terrible king. Unlike his father, who was confident and a great fighter, Henry VI was an absolute useless wuss. Oh. A real wussy boy. Dave, were you sort of starting to relate a bit more? That's why I'm bringing this character up. <laughs> bring wusses back. That's what I'm trying to bring back. Yeah. Let wusses rule. But importantly, he was also crowned king of France. But this was, of course, disputed by his mother's brother, Uncle Charles VI. Uncle Charles. Who said uh, that Uncle, he... Uncle, sh- Uncle Chunky. He said... Unky Chunky said, I should be king. <laughs> <laughs> Unky Chunky. He couldn't say Chucky. He couldn't. He was a baby, he wasn't was he? He was a baby king. <laughs> baby king. At 16, Chunky. he still couldn't speak properly. <laughs> Unky Chunky. So he's crowned king of France. He's like, all right, I'm king of France. And then Charles is like, no, I'm the old other king's son. I'm king of France. Yep. So it was back on in the Hundred Years' War. Oh. Oh. Wait, so but they're both on the same side. So, oh, right. So the France guy, Fr- the French guy wants to be in Fran- charge of French France. French uncle comes in and goes, "No, I'm, I'm yeah, in like charge." Yeah, because his dad said, "Oh, when I die, the English can have it." But now the guy he said Henry V who could have it died. So Charles's son is like, "No." I imagine France That's would over. not have loved their king going. Yeah, we'll stay French as long as I'm alive, and then whatever. Yeah, who then gives after a shit? It, who cares? Who cares? I'm dead. Yeah. And Fran's like, well, a lot of us will still be alive. Don't care. I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> and I'm going to heaven because I'm king. So it's back on for the Hundred Years' War because of this now they're both claiming that they are king again. And for a while after the Battle of Argincourt, the tide went the way of the English. It's almost like the French needed a secret weapon. Oh. Okay. Bazooka? Yes. Oh, is this when atomic bombs were invented? Yes, it is. No, enter one of the most famous names in all of human history, Joan of Arc. 
Okay. Ooh, I mean, you say that we know what the topic is, so we were expecting Joan to be yep. mentioned at some point. Here she is. How does the name work? Is it surnames Ark, middle name of, or is surname of Ark? Or first name, Joan of. It's actually uh, very difficult to say because uh, they didn't use surnames as commonly as they do now. And so there's debate about... Because she's not from Ark. Right. They're like, is that... Her surname is Ark? So there's actually quite a Mm. bit of debate over that historically. Okay. When when was it first used as a name, Joan of Ark? Joan of Ark. Uh, For a long time, she's been known as Joan de Ark. But she just called herself uh, La Pucelle or The Maid. Huh. That was her name that. for herself. So where'd Joan come from? <laughs> well, that is her birth name, though. Yeah. Uh, born around 1412. So she was like you, trying to start a nickname. She was like, hey, what's up? I'm the maid. And they're like, all right, The Joan. maid's a pretty good nickname. All right, Joan. And you're like, hey, it's me, Cobra. And everyone's like, whatever, Dave. All right, whatever Joan. Spoons. <laughs> all right, Joan. <laughs> Can I call you Joan. So she's born around. <laughs> yes, you absolutely can call Thank me Joan. You. Love that. Better than spoons. <laughs> Spoony. Oh, he's spoony. Uh, born around 1412, uh, Jean de Arc, or in English, Joan of Arc, was the daughter of a tenant farmer with an incredible name Jacques de Arc. Oh, that is Jacques good. de Arc. Jacques so de her Arc. dad was of Arc. Yeah. So maybe that's why she got the of Arc. Yeah, but then there's also debate about that. Whether Jacques he's from of, of whether, Arc or Whether not. he's a Jacques or a Jacques or... But Jacques. I just, my favourite version, Jacques d'Arc. Jacques d'Arc. It's very good. Uh, they lived in the village of Domremy in northeastern France and owned a 50-acre farm. Domremy fa solati do... Farm. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what note was that? <laughs> <laughs> That's me going I'll go high Then going no I'll go low And then my voice being like Nah You'll go I, mean, where I, I, go, I, f- I fucked you there right Because it, you're meant to do that f- f- So far thing Up and down maybe And I just kept going up And then yeah. you No that's how it goes It's all up I mean it's a scale It's, it's Right Well I'm You know I'm self taught with music stuff So Do ra mi fa so la ti do Oh it does And look then good. you either go back Fun. down <laughs> 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 also, <laughs> reading my report, I've written that they lived in northeastern France and owned a 50 acre arm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big wow. arm. That's, it's fucking huge, mate. That's huge. You should get that checked. <laughs> what, 50 acre? My God. <laughs> and what a weird measurement for an arm. <laughs> no. It's a 50 acre arm. Okay. <laughs> Farm. <That's> ridiculous. <laughs> uh, Joan never learned to read or write. But her mother, her mother, her mother, Isabel Romy, was extremely pious and instilled in her daughter a deep love for the Catholic Church and its teachings. These beliefs would drive her entire life. Okay. Henry the Sixth, the Baby King, took the throne in fourteen twenty-two at nine months when Joan. The potty, would- Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Babies don't use thrones. <laughs> Straight to the potty. <laughs> it's solid gold. <laughs> we do like training. <laughs> do we do like throne training? <laughs> Sorry, we're just uh, we're throne training at the moment, so it might be an accident or two. <laughs> we're getting him to shit into a crown. <laughs> but he's doing all right. He's doing pretty well. He's doing pretty well. I can read him. I know when he needs to shit. Apparently when he was a baby, um, like his teachers and advisors had to get a special law written by the, the Regency Council to say that they wouldn't get in trouble later for telling him off. Because they were worried that, like, later, like I'm telling this eight year old, I'm his teacher, I've got to teach him how to be a king, or yeah. basic, all basic school stuff. But I've also got to be able to punish him. Yeah. But I'm worried that later on he'll come back and yeah. cut my head off for this. So there was a special thing saying, oh, no, no, you can tell the king off. Wow. Because he's a child. <laughs> Bit of fun. He's a baby king. He's a baby. If they're, I mean, yeah, that's amazing. If they were that afraid they had to change the laws, then they're yeah. probably not going hard on him anyway. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, three, three plus three, seventeen, whatever. Seven, yeah, that's yep. great. Yeah, yeah, close enough. Well done. Yes. You are the smartest that's boy great. alive. Set fire to my cloak. That's fine. That's I love great. this game. In fact, uh, uh, it's not okay. It's wonderful. <laughs> I actually, yeah, I was hoping it would uh, get ashy. Thank you, my lord. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. May I have another? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. the baby king took the throne at nine months old in fourteen twenty two, and that was when Joan was around ten. So okay. I've gone back in time just a little bit. Yep. Uh, during this time, England occupied much of northern France and many in Joan's village were forced to abandon their homes under threat of invasion. Ooh. The English were allied, allied with the, the Duke of Burgundy, 
or Duchy of Burgundy, and they had control of the north of France. Henry's armies were in alliance with those of Philip the Good, who's the Duke of Burgundy. You're going to have to trust this guy. His father was John the Fearless. Oh, okay. pretty that's cool. Pretty John too. the Fearless is fantastic. Yeah, I love that. But John the Fearless had been assassinated in 1419 by... Needed a bit more fear. Well, he was, he was taken out by people associated with Charles the Seventh. So, the, that's why they hate, hate... That's why they're like, we're on the side of the English, even though we're uh, closer to France. Because you killed my dad. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's interesting. I do, yeah. So, I wonder what kind of ongoing um, effect the English occupation has on current France. Because I know... The French and the other way, when the Normans came over to England, it changed a lot of their language. The English language was changed a lot. I wonder if there was some sort of effect in reverse. Probably well, not something you've looked into, but... Well, I imagine the effect would be much more if the war didn't turn out a certain way, Ooh. which we'll find out about. Sizzle. Uh, most of Joan's village, however, favoured... So, there's the the English are an ally with the Burgundians. Yep. Most of Joan's village, however, favoured the Armagnac faction... And Charles the Seventh, who claimed to be uh, the king, and they ruled the south. So there's sort of a divide in France at this time. Joan and her village was right in the middle of the conflict zone. She later said her village was quote a place where children literally fought children. Some of them coming back wounded and bloodied. Jeez. It's not ideal, is it? So yeah, it's a, little, it's a pretty tumultuous place to be. The main problem for the guy she favors, favors, favors Charles the Seventh was, despite claiming to be king for five years by 1427 he still hadn't been crowned this is because in Rome or reims as english people say the traditional place for the investiture of french kings was well within the territory held by his enemies so as long as he remained unconsecrated the rightfulness of the claim to be king of france was open to challenge so but he couldn't be crowned king because the place where you get crowned is in enemy territory and there's someone else who's the king, right? The baby. Well, he's claiming to, he's claiming to be king as well, yeah. Yeah, so... And the baby has been crowned? I mean, the baby crowned early on, you know, hopefully... Very early After on. not too long of a... a, a uh, what do you call it? Oh, I don't know. When someone gives birth? Labor? Labor. Crowning's when the <laughs> yeah, head pokes yeah. out. <laughs> that would have been better if I could have got to the labor word. Hey, don't worry, I'll myself. fix it in post. Thank you. Yeah, so Henry the Sixth, he has declared himself king in his way, but the the, the French way. Gaga. <laughs> but um, the the French way, we've got to go to this special place to be consecrated, but we can't get there. Right. And so everyone else is like, "Well, mate, you haven't even been to the place where you be crowned king, so I guess you're not even king." Yeah, that would. I mean, that's true. It's like, oh yeah, I'm also king. I just haven't made it yeah, there yet. Made it. We're all king. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, because you got to go there. So, um, because it's like a holy place where God basically declares you king. And they're like, well, mate, you can't even get here to be declared king. So, I don't think you've got God on your side. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be like, oh, yeah, God? Yeah, God's with you. Yeah, he's just, for some reason, working yeah. in mysterious ways again, is he? Hmm? All right, mate. Yeah, So, it, and that really op- leaves you open to, to like a lot of challenge. Yeah. People really only say God works in mysterious ways when bad things happen, don't they? Like, nobody wins a billion dollars and goes, bloody hell, God works in a serious way, doesn't he? They say, yeah, I guess you say, well, God looked after me today. It's yeah. only when, like, someone dies too young and people say, well, <laughs> he works in mysterious ways. Yeah. It's like, it's a it's a comforting yourself kind of thing. I think, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think we should start signing for everything. Yeah. Oh, Mostly I'm for hungry. mysteries, I think. God works in mysterious <laughs> ways. Yeah. wonder why that could be. Maybe because you haven't eaten for a while. Hmm. Nah. <laughs> no. It's a mystery. Mystery. We'll never know. At the age of 13, the extremely religious Joan of Arc started to hear voices. The first time she was in her garden and later described it as, the voice came from the right, from the direction of the church, and was accompanied by a bright light. Well, this is just like uh, Paul, who was Saul. Heard the voice? Yeah, yeah heard the voice and got the light oh, in his no. eyes. You'd hear that. You'd, and you'd be like, oh, no, I'm about to go blind. Yeah. Yeah, because this isn't a post-Saul war- world. Yeah. This isn't a post-Saul <laughs> this Paul. Is like, this after is, Paul. This is ages after Saul's time, I think. Saul, Saul was early days. Yeah. This is a PSW. Post-Saul Wars. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, sometimes the ringing of church bells seem to encourage the visions to speak or voices to speak through visions to Joan. Okay. Uh, the first voice she heard was that of St. Michael. And soon she began to hear from St. Catherine and St. Margaret as well. Wow. And uh, they introduced themselves to her. Hey. <laughs> hey, Michael here. Um, you know, like they do when after a, a footy game and the the commentators back in the commentary box are interviewing the footballer and like... Yeah. Hey, Jared Waitley, um, great game. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it like that? Only yeah, totally. St. Michael here. Um, love what you're doing in the garden. Maybe it's more like when you have a dream and you are somebody else or there's like a, a face you don't know but you know that's your mum in your yeah, dream. Maybe right. it's like that. Yeah, that makes Where sense. Where she's just like, you why are we there? I know that's St. Michael. Well, if St. Michael's t- contacting you, you you'll just you'll know. know. But imagine if St. Catherine and St. Margaret had very similar voices and you're like, sorry, which one's speaking now? I can't tell. Sorry. But from what she heard, Joan determined they'd been sent by God to give her an extremely important mission. Okay. That is, Joan's purpose on earth was to save France by expelling its enemies, uh, i.e. the English and the Burgundians, and then install Charles VII as the rightful King of France. Wow. She took a vow of chastity at that moment and apparently avoided a marriage her father attempted to arrange when she was 16. Yeah, well, that makes uh, that makes sense. If you're told by St. Michael, etc., to not get married, I think that overrules Dad. Sorry, sorry. Dad. Sorry, Dad. Uh, but Saint I'm sorry, are you Saint to. Dad? Yeah, last yeah. time I checked, you're not Saint Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not Saint Dad. <laughs> you're not Saint anything. Yeah. <laughs> I will not go to my room because St. Michael didn't tell me to. You are irrelevant. Oh, hang on. St. Michael's telling me to go to my room. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Off I go right now. <laughs> According to uh, Live Science or Live Science, never sure which way to say that mm. one, uh, modern day medical doctors... Genuinely? Surely it's Live Science. But these people I've, are but they're so obsessed with science. Maybe they live science. Oh, my God. And I've and never what, considered what's that. What's live about it? Oh, my God. It's <laughs> Maybe like, it's Live Science. It's like in excesses... Live Baby Live or Live Baby Live. <laughs> they sing Live Baby Live, but the live album is called Live Baby Live, right? Uh, that's confusing. Or is it Live Baby Live I still? Know. I don't know. And it can, should be Live it, Baby Live Live. Yeah. That would clear it up. <laughs> but can it be Live Live Baby Live? Can it be Live Baby Live? <laughs> oh, it could be. Or Live Baby Live. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my brain hurts. Anyway, according to Live Life Science, uh, Live Life Learn, uh, modern day <laughs> medical doctors have speculated that Joan may have suffered from a medical condition such as schizophrenia or a form of epilepsy, which made her hear voices. But people always try and speculate and diagnose historical figures centuries after their deaths. I choose to believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if she didn't back it up, then maybe. But it feels like everything that they tell her is right, isn't it? Well, let's find out. In 1428, at the age of 16, one of Joan's visions told her to leave her village and go deep into France to meet the Dauphin, which is the title given to Charles VII. It's kind of like heir to the throne. It's given to the king's oldest son. Did you say the Dauphin? Dauphin. The Dauphin. Oh, Dauphin. But it's very similar to... What does that mean? Dauphin. It's very similar to Dauphin. In fact, when you... Very intelligent animals. Yeah. Beautiful animals, very intelligent. Airs, yeah, they are very intelligent. <laughs> they uh, airs, they also they also have sex for fun. It's just them and humans. Yeah, so. And uh, when you translate dolphin. And others as well. I think you, they're finding more and more all the time. <laughs> when you translate dolphin into French, it is dauphin. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> and dauphin for the feminine. So it is, it, it does mean dolphin. Yes, but then it also means this, this title. It, yeah, okay. But I'm not sure if that's related. That's a linguistics question. Holy shit. I act, I know French and I d- didn't even realise it. Isn't that amazing? You heard mm. Dauphin and thought Dolphin. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that wild? <laughs> that is pretty wild. <laughs> Actually, St. Michael said, yeah, I know French. <laughs> so that's sick. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, imagine if you were speaking English to her this whole time. She's like, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Got to go get Google Translate. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking so about. Why are you speaking English, Michael? <laughs> you were from not England. Yeah, that's right. So, um, <laughs> I know my saints. Yeah, not England, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm ruling out England. Okay. I'll rule out Australia. Yeah. New Zealand. Nah. Put a line through that. Yep. I reckon Michael's probably from somewhere. He was one of the apostles, that Michael? Michael was an apostle. Right? Was he? I think it, so. Was that, I mean, there's probably more than one St. Michael, though. 
But I, it, I it, I was I'm to guessing the... he's from the Jerusalem region. Yeah. And they was... spoke very little English very back then. Very little English. Back, back in then. the year zero yeah. to 33, yeah. <laughs> whatever part of that period it was. Yeah. I thought I was talking to the uh, religious slash French expert here. Well, I did do religious education all the way to year 10. All the way to I year once, 10? Uh, there was a time, I've told this story before, there was once in primary school, the teacher said, all right, we want to put it, everyone put a name in this hat. We need more priests. So everyone put a name in this hat who of someone you think could be a good priest and we'll all pray that these people become priests. And it was the people in your lives or people in the class? Uh, I think it was just people in our lives. So you, and like, I, what? And, I was, and there was sort of, there was a bit of a, I think there was some, um, they were, it did feel like, they were saying, put your names in there. And uh, so I put my name in there and prayed that I'd become a priest. But I mean, I'd, it feels like the kind of thing you don't need to pray. You just, I'm in control of that. I you could, can absolutely decide on that. But um, but that day, I, th- I think I wanted... What a strange recruitment choice. Yeah. Can well, I... it's similar to making, uh, giving people a CD and making them watch a movie. Yeah, true. Can I ask what your job is now? Priest. Well, <laughs> Holy shit, I never connected the two. Yeah, you did that. Mm. Yeah. You prayed that. Holy shit is right. (laughs) And you can say that. We can't say that. Sorry, sorry. I was quoting you. Yeah, that's otherwise it's sacrilege. So in 1428, at the age of 16, Joan's vision told her to leave her village, go to France, deep into the country to to meet the Dauphin. Dolphin. Meet the Dolphin. (laughs) 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 She'd been practicing for ages. (laughs) Man, a thousand noises strikes again. (laughs) Rub his blowhole and see what happens. Anyway, led by the voices of her saints, Joan travelled on May or in May fourteen twenty eight from her village to the nearest stronghold where the military still loyal to the Dauphin was stationed. She asked the captain of the garrison, Robert de Baudricourt, for permission to join the Dauphin. He laughed off the sixteen year old's claims of visions and her divine purpose, and Joan went back home. Very sad. He just laughed it off. Yeah, she's like Said. I need to talk to the king. I've been sent by God. I've had visions. And he's like, like <laughs> okay. All right, kid. All right. That would be brutal. Go back home. How old is she at this point? She's 16. Yeah, okay. But Joan had a higher purpose in life and wasn't going to take no for an answer. And she went back to the garrison in January 1429. Because, I mean, if if you're getting... If St. Michael and others, yeah. Margaret included, yeah. are coming to you... You don't just go, well, this guy laughed at me, I'll give up. You go, well, this is my divine yeah. right or my div- like this is this is my what I'm meant to you, do. You can't really go back to those saints and be like, it didn't um go well. Didn't pan out. Sorry. So thank you. I did try. But bye. So you got are you guys often wrong? Yeah. Because it seems you might be wrong here cause Could you stop talking to me now? <laughs> Could you no, I tried. You can't do that. No. Nah, you go Saints. Uh, I've let you down, but I'll go again. You'd assume they'd say something like, hey, we saw that coming. That's all part of it. It's part of it. Yeah. You know? God works yeah. in mysterious ways. Yeah. That's ex- yes. For some reason, being laughed out of a garrison. part of the plan is you get laughed at. Yeah. But that makes you stronger. I mean, knowing that means you probably aren't going to be made stronger. Anyway, whatever. So just go again. Or, you know, Dave, you take it from here, but yeah, that's basically And she, did, she went again in January, yeah, and to quote go. from uh, Britannica here, which, Matt, I'm sure you've read this article. Well, this is a bit one-sided. I want to hear from French Attica. <laughs> <laughs> Let the record show. Jess is giving me a thumbs up. And I'm back in. Back it doesn't look patronising, though. No, it wasn't patronising. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, quote from uh, Britannica, with apologies, that's not, but I've actually got a French website coming out. Fantastic. So don't worry about it. How'd Fantastic. You read that? How'd you read that? <laughs> you do know French. I, do, I know. I know uh, a little. <laughs> La little. Oh, the um, little? <laughs> <laughs> to quote from Britannica. Uh, this time, her quiet firmness and piety gained her the respect of the people, and the captain persuaded that she was neither a witch nor feeble-minded, allowed her to go to the Dauphin at Chinon. It's the only two things women could be. <laughs> well, feeble-minded. Yeah. No, I don't <laughs> or think so. Or a witch. So. Or a witch. Which one are you? Feeble-minded. Okay. <laughs> Come on, mate. <laughs> what are you? Me a witch. That's what a witch would say. Damn it. Got ourselves a witch. All right. Chuck her into the water. Let's see if she floats. <laughs> 
Joan was able to attract a small band of followers who believed her claims to be the virgin who, according to a popular prophecy, was destined to save France. Oh. So they're already like, all right, this kid could be the real deal. Oh, that's fantastic. So there were, it had been foretold. Yeah, apparently in that part of the world they were waiting for this and they were like, I think this could be her. So she was allowed to go. It's at this point that Joan famously cropped her hair and began to dress in what was traditionally men's clothing. Okay. Accompanied by six armed men, she travelled for 11 days on horseback, often through enemy territory. How big were the arms? Uh, about 50 acres. Wow. <laughs> really big. Honestly, I'll say it again. Get that checked. Yeah, that's, that's, that's massive. That's You can't live like that. You've got, yeah. yeah, that's swelling there. That's, yeah. Mm, it's not Might a tumor. be a cyst. Not yeah. a tumor. We we'll put a, le- a leech on that. Yeah. We'll get that sorted for you real nice. That, please. <laughs> what size arm are you hoping right. for? We'll either save your life or you will die tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Choice is yours. Better than having a 50 acre arm. What are these uh, men's clothes she's wearing? Sort of like cut off cargo shorts? Yeah. Yeah, like. Khaki. Boots. (laughs) Boots, uh, like a. A Kubra. A um, a Bing Tang singlet. Bing Tang singlet. (laughs) This is what I think men wear traditionally. One of the male ones. You you can get women's size Bing Tang singlet. She's wearing uh, Oakley's or (laughs) Folkley's. Wrap around. Wrap around. around. Speed (laughs) Dumps She just, she's just this is what men means to me, apparently. This is what my brain goes to when I think, men, okay, men. Now, what do <laughs> What's a man? men? You I'm look, I look at across at Dave. Dave. You could look at yourself. I look down at myself. You're both wearing jeans and a men. T-shirt. <laughs> now. What do men wear? Men, what men, do men, men wear? Uh, button-up shirts. Yes. Hold um, a briefcase. A tie. Yeah. Was this sort of thing? Dress shoes. Some, some mix of these two. Was it businessman or was it uh, weekend men? Yeah. Was it barley man? He was barley man. Barley, barley man. man. Bintangs and bordies. Yeah. What a superhero that would be. And but. knock off Javiana flip flops. Oh, she was flipping and flopping yeah. all over that horse. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible Actually, horse riding shoes. Oh, yeah. Not good. It was clipping and clopping. She was flipping and flopping. I saw a woman the other day <laughs> on a bike with one of those little trailers on the back that had two kids in it. Two. So she's... On a bike, two kids in a little trailer on the back, and she's wearing flip flops. She's wearing thongs. Wow. On a, on a bike. That's that's good work. Towing some kids. That's badass. I was like, towing, yeah. towing with the toes out. That's absolutely wild. I was like, yeah. you are my hero, but also I hate you. <laughs> Those toes go on the spokes. You're oh. losing a toe. Yeah. What are you doing? Happened to a friend of a friend of mine. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Lost a toe. Lost in the a spoke. toe on the spokes. I got double. Have you ever been double unplugged? I got double. Un- I was walking up a wet hill. He's talking about wearing <laughs> thongs. Double unplugged. Yes, I'm with you now. Yep. And <laughs> For some reason, wet hill got me there. I both like, wet hill in thongs. No. Yeah, I know. It was already silly, <laughs> and both like both came out at once, and I face planted. That's impressive, actually. <laughs> Yeah, you get one. But you know how sometimes you can't get them back in. Could you get them back in? Could, Could you but they're weakened. It's yeah. like dislocating a shoulder. Yeah. After you do it once, it's gonna go again. Yeah. Ironically, did you dislocate your shoulder? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you weakened everything that day. Double unplugged. Yeah, I don't. It never happened to me before. Wow. I'm like, I'm, I, I'd, I'd fallen. I'm like, that's embarrassing, but what a beautiful moment. Yeah. Double unplugged. I've only, I've only been unplugged once, and it was recent. Right. And only one, sadly. But yeah, I, I was like, it like finally they used to. happened. <laughs> <laughs> finally, I was so excited. Couldn't fix it. Had to buy new ones. Damn. That is annoying, actually. Full blowout. Yeah. But, and a blowout. You know. Double blowout. Double blowout. This, is, this doesn't need explanation. Flip flops, thongs. Yeah, I've used flip flops fairly interchangeably yeah. there. So and, people. And the they've context. got the little. Jandals. Jandals, yeah. Because, yeah, I know, I know Americans in the past have been confused. They're thinking we're talking about uh, G strings. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I've also had a double blowout on a G string. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so accompanied by six armed men, she traveled for 11 days on horseback through enemy territory, traveling over 300 miles in total. They only moved at night, avoided towns, and at times went through the wilderness. Ooh. But finally, they reached the castle at Chignon. This was a time. When a woman wearing men's clothing or vice versa was considered to be a big sin. Many right. have speculated why Joan have cut her hair and wore what was traditionally men's clothing. Because, like I said, it's a very famous part in her story. Imagine that being a sin, like clothing that you wear. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you think this benevolent God is about? Yeah, what, you think they're so worried confusing. about clothes? You, you have to wear clothes 
that match your genitals. <laughs> it's it's super it's odd. It's so weird, isn't it? So I, I've heard people speculate why a, f- a couple of reasons. One is might might have been easier to ride a horse. Yeah. Dressed in those clothing. Oh, God's worried about that. But it, it's like it's fairly recent where women have been acceptably able to wear trousers, like pants of any kind. Yeah, remember not in my house. <laughs> 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 if you ever rock up in pants to my house, Jess. <laughs> Matt does make me wear a little petticoat every time. And a, and a, and a big skirt. You'll have to put on the house skirt. <laughs> <laughs> so keep by the door. <laughs> Help yourself to one of the house skirts. Yeah. But those pants are off, young lady. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's fairly recent. So, this yeah, is strange. 500 years ago or whatever. Like, it is it is pretty wild that Real she's wearing time. men's clothing. I, I have heard many speculations. Some people say she might have done it for the horse, maybe just to blend in because she was going through a like, yep. treacherous journey. Also, possibly to avoid being assaulted by men that they come across. Also, the men that she's traveling with. Yep. I've heard a female oh, story. Oh, great. Yeah. So, I'm not assaulted by the enemies or the yeah, people I'm with. Seriously. Awful. Oh, oh, my God. What, um, was, what did the church bells mean to her? She can hear from St. Michael. I'm not sure if the mics are picking up, but there is a church bell ringing very close to that us right St. now. St. Anthony. <gasps> What's he saying? He's saying... Please do go on. Do <laughs> go on. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, please do go you on. You're that? Please do go on. Please do go on. Stop faffing about and, <laughs> and get on with get it. Back Something like that. that. I don't know if that's what you're getting. Yeah. Same. It's in French, but I understand it. Saying I'm loving this report. Yeah. Can you two stop interrupting? I'm it's loving, annoying. I love all of you. I feel nothing but love and wear whatever you like. Yeah. Also, St. Michael's a hack. <laughs> yeah, you did add that. <laughs> all right, mate. Yeah. There's, always, there's, there's rivalries amongst the saints. Oh, he's saying, please call me Tony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On your St. Tony. Anthony was my father. <laughs> <laughs> I'm St. <Saint> Tony. <laughs> okay, so she got to the castle and her mission was to see the king and convince him of her missions. We will never know what happened at Chignon. Is one of the, it is one of the abiding mysteries of history, writes Marina Warner, professor of University of Essex, in her book, Joan of Arc, The Image of Female Heroism. But there is a common story told a few different ways, but it goes a little something like this. Oh. Uh, the Dauphin, Charles, was initially uncertain whether to receive her when she first arrived. Okay. His counsellors gave him conflicting advice, but two days later, he granted her an audience. Some people were like, don't see her, she's the devil. And other people were like, the prophecy is being foretold. Mm. So eventually he's like, all right, send her in. But as a test to see if she was the real deal, Charles hid himself amongst his courtiers and a different man was presented to her as king. When she met the imposter, she immediately pointed out, no, that is not the king. She then went up to the real King Charles, dressed as a normal man, and introduced herself, possibly bowing at his feet. This feels like a Shakespeare script. Yeah, pretty cool. Being like, no, you're an imposter. They're like, no, that's the king. She said, this is the king. And they said, no, this is just a normal man. And then she bowed at his feet and he was like, okay. I am the king. Oh, that's great. I think Queen Amidala pulled a, a thing like that in one of the Star Wars prequels as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. They ripped off Joan of Arc. That's sick. Uh, it's, I mean, the, and it's not like now you'd be like, yeah, well, I've seen him on the telly. Obviously, that's not him. That's him. Mm. But back then, yeah, that's the she thing. probably would have only ever seen exactly. paintings at, at most. Yeah. And maybe at, not at, even. At, at mo- no, to be honest, probably not even, no. Yeah. You wouldn't know. So, for her to know that is pretty... I mean that's another sign that Yeah, she's she's legit. She's sent. And they would have and to them that would have proved it. But Charles was still uncertain. Okay, not quite. On the Dauphin's order she was interrogated by ecclesiastical authorities and examined to prove that she was still a virgin. Which oh my is God. horrific. She was then taken to Portier for three weeks where she was further questioned by eminent the- theologians to verify her morality. So, they, like, gave her a bunch of questions to prove that she was the real deal. What, what, any, what kind of question do you think about? What would you question me to check my morality? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave, what would you, what would you, what, what kind I, of questions would you ask? Are you the devil? Uh, no. Okay. Any um, follow ups? Are you evil? No. Nah. Are you good? N- uh, yeah. How good? Uh, real good. 
Real, real good. Okay. Do you want to kill the king with me right now? Yep. Nah. Got nah, her. Got it. Take her away. Got it. Also, take me away because I said I'd kill the king. Fuck. I got distracted looking up because I was pretty sure it was <laughs> Kira Knightley who played. Ke- Kira Knightley and Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman. Looks, Portman. They look yeah. so similar at the time. Ah. Yeah, it's a pretty good double. Actually, yeah. God damn. Really similar. It looked really similar. Yeah, right. I didn't realize. Yeah, I didn't realize Kira. That it was, was pre Kira Knightley fame. Yeah. Maybe. So that's where I went. <laughs> just then, I was like, I'm pretty sure it's Kira Knightley, but I don't want to say it's Kira Knightley. Because you were looking case. at me while I asked the question, and I thought you were listening. Nah. And then you just <laughs> sort of kept I was not listening. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jess, what you've mainly missed is they interrogated her to yes. prove she's the real deal. Yep. She said, she, she answered their question, but she said she would give proof of her claims of divinity, not with them now, but in Orléans, a city in north central France that for months had been under siege by English forces. Okay. The consensus at the time was that if Orléans fell to the English, all of France would fall. Right. Very important strategic city. So, it was really, really important in the scheme of the decades-long war. And at this point, the English had been winning for months. It looked like they were going to take the city. Right. Again, from Britannica. In their report, the churchmen suggested, this is the people that have been interviewing her, that in view of the desperate situation of Olion, which had been under siege by England for months, the Dauphin would be well advised to make use of her. Okay, basically, shit is so bad, we may as well roll the dice on this yeah, teenage great. kid. Honestly, yeah. let's give her a go. Give her a go. <laughs> she seems all right. She seems all right. We don't really have any other plans. She could identify the king. Yeah. That's pretty That's good. That's impressive. Pretty good. She said she wasn't bad when I asked. Yeah. I don't think the devil would be able to lie. No. I think the devil's like a cop. <laughs> yeah. They got to tell you, <laughs> you if got, you ask him. Got, yeah, you if you ask. Confess. You undercover cop? You undercover devil? Fuck. You got to say. <laughs> They've got to say. You got to say it. If Cops. they say it later, it's like massive dick move. It was it was really annoying when that happened for this cop who uh, was undercover in the mafia for seven years, and then <laughs> they never thought to ask. They never thought, and then uh, the Don finally went, "You a cop," and he had to say, "Yeah." Sorry, what? I can't hear. The Don was looking through his paperwork, and yeah. he was like, "Oh, we've actually not got a form saying you're not a cop." Yeah, that's so. funny. Usually, I ask this on day one. I'm really embarrassed. Sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Let's obviously, just get this out of the way. Obviously, a formality. We've known each other for years. Like yeah. you are, uh, I'm the godfather, and you're the godfather to my grandchild. Yeah. So this is very nice. Uh, so, are you a cop? Oh no. Well, sorry, what? The rules are: I have to answer this. Yeah, it's a bad day for everyone. You're going to kill me yeah. though, aren't you? you got Damn me. it! All right, you got me, Don Vito. I am a cop. Well, I am a cop. <laughs> I ah, duh, yeah, you're a you, cop. Die. I got so close to the end. Oh god, we got we got to kill him. Take I'm him so out. So disappointed. <laughs> anyway, it's been fun. Been fun playing mafia with you. All right, <laughs> hey, <Uru. right. laughs> Mafia pop. So she said, "I want to go to Orleon," and then she asked for an army, and the Dauphin gave it to her. She was also given a military. How big was the army? <laughs> Fifty acres. <laughs> <laughs> She was given a military household of several men and a squire, so your dad John would be happy to. <laughs> I forgot you were very much aware of dad calling everybody squire. I think he's not good with names. Uh, you know, a squ- squire. Do you know a squire is a young nobleman acting as an attendant to a knight before becoming a knight himself. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. That's not a bad thing. Kind yeah. of a junior knight. Yeah. yeah, right. So next time, John, if you're listening, if you call me knight, that would be... Very nice. Sir, Sir Dave. No, Dave, you're still master. Yes, Dave I am. So you are a squire. I'm definitely a squire. A young squire. Matt sir Dave is a, a sir. Lot. Sir Dave a lot. <laughs> you are a lot of yeah, Dave. You're a bit much. <laughs> sir Dave, a bit much. <laughs> uh, sir Dave a little less would be great. <laughs> <laughs> sir Dave, got you about a nine or a ten. Yeah. Can we get you down to about yeah. a four? Yeah. So Joan uh, had her standard, which is her little image that she takes with her, painted with an image of Christ in judgment and a banner made bearing the name of Jesus. She was asked if she would like a sword and she declared that it would be found in the church of St. Catherine de Fabois and Britannica records that one was in fact discovered there. <gasps> Pretty cool. They said, yeah, do so you want a sword? She goes, check that church. That's where you'll find my sword. And they're like, ah, we've actually got one. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And churches wouldn't normally just have a sword handy. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's it sort is of like saying, "Did you want a Bible? Oh, well, 
Mm. Go have a look in that church over there. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll find one. A, a Bible, yeah? Mine's in that motel's top yeah. drawer <laughs> on the bedside table. Bedside yep. table. Either side. <laughs> There's also a couple of bickies. Yeah. It once belonged to the Gideons. <laughs> Uh, several hundred men were mustered and they set out for Olion, which had been besieged for six months and was almost totally surrounded by a ring of English strongholds. Oh. One story from uh, Live Live Science recounts that she wasn't in charge of the force, but rather it was led by Count Dunois, who initially ignored Joan's advice. She wanted to attack, but he was keen to sneak his force around the English. Oh, so, ring around the ringer. Sort of play it cool yeah. for a while, see what's going on. Jones succeeded in making a believer out of the count when he found his force stranded beside a, beside a riverbank, unable to bring supplies to Oleon across barge because the wind was against them. She also said, is this your card? <laughs> and he said, oh my God, Oh my it God, is, is, oh is my this God. your bard? <laughs> <laughs> is that a fun? <laughs> yeah, that's a pun. Yes. She told the Count, I am bringing you better help than ever you got from any soldier or any city. It is the help of the King of Heaven. That's I always find it interesting when God will take sides in country v country battles. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Why? So what, yeah, he's got yeah. a problem with the English at this point, obviously. Yeah, well, obviously there's only one rightful king. Yeah, okay. He's only chosen one. That's true. You've got to choose a side. And okay. he's chosen, in her mind, the uh, the Charles VII. So she said, I'm bringing you help of the King of Heaven. The Count later claimed that at that moment, the wind changed direction, allowing his force to, and supplies to cross into Orleans. Right. It's just another story. And then from then on, he was like, all right, she's legit. I'll listen to this woman. I'm saying he for God because the most recent representation of God I've seen was in uh, the film... Bedazzled. Yes. Oh, fantastic. And in that, it was, uh, God was played by a man. If I'd just recently seen Dogma, yeah. I'd be saying she because Alanis Morris. You always go God. through the most recent movie. Yeah, that's and I right. Appreciate well, that. God works in a serious way. That's so. right. However, he or she. God is omnipresent. Shows themselves to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why would. If it was a he, why would he let you watch Dogma? If it was a she, why would she let you watch Bedazzled? Exactly. That's a question. <laughs> I don't have an answer. That's a question. It's just a question. Thank you for identifying that. There's that probably some question. theists, theologists out there who could answer that. Love to hear from or some either theolo- of those theologians. Theologians. Great what? word, isn't it? Yeah, if a real one. Is that the one I said? What's a theist? That's nothing. Yeah, someone who believes in uh, it's, it's one God, isn't it? Right. See, this is why Dictionary you are Dave. sellies, no more gaps. Yep. No more gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> It's a person who believes in the existence of a god or gods, specifically a creator who intervenes in the universe. Oh. Oh. That's the dictionary. So definition. not Nick Cave, because he doesn't believe in an interventionist god. That's how he mm. starts one of his songs. But I know that you do. Yes. Is he talking to me? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Right. yeah, well, I'm a theist then. Uh, History.com makes the note that although she, this is Joan, would be later remembered as a fearless warrior, and there was no doubt that she was absolutely fearless, which will... Absolutely talk about. Joan never actually fought in a battle or killed an opponent. So you say there's no doubt she was absolutely fearless. Has she come across a cockroach? Ooh. Cool. About a little creepy crawly. Oh my god. Big spider. There was a cockroach in our office yesterday. And did you evacuate the building? I was surprised at how cool and calm and collected I was. You're yeah. lying. Yeah, I only broke one window. <laughs> <laughs> I only leapt from a third story building. <laughs> <laughs> my god. Usually I <laughs> Usually I really overreact. <laughs> Usually, but that was completely, completely fine. That was actually very cool. <laughs> she, <laughs> so so Joan, Joan is fearless. Um, okay. But she, she never fought in a battle or killed an opponent. Instead, she would accompany her man as a sort of inspirational mascot, brandishing her banner in place of a weapon. So they gave her a sword, but she never actually... She's not out right. there stabbing men so in the face. So she's just a flag bearer. Yeah, she's like a... Is that the whole time? I pictured her just like going around swinging the sword, no, chopping she, heads. She and got stuff. her banner going, come on, come on. And it worked because everywhere she went, Joan was an immediate morale boost. Whoa, much like our own little Joan over there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Stop trying to make Joan happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's so happen. she was just a mascot, kind of. Yeah, but saying, I'm, I'm sent here by God to encourage you. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that makes some sense. If, if you're believing that God's sending her, 
That would be a real moral boost. You're yeah, like, totally. oh, we'll yeah. win this fight. Exactly. I've got God on our side. Yeah. yeah. But I'd, she's not like a Stallone or like Van Damme, like take, breaking, pe- breaking people's necks and like God's throwing grenades. Me, God, me, I, I, I can't be a kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, none of that. That's my Stallone. Is that good? That's, That's pretty good Stallone. Oh, right now, let's hear your Van Damme. I can't do Van Damme. <laughs> I've not seen enough Van Damme to be able to do a good Van Damme. He always plays his own twin. Ah, yes. Always. Yeah, that's good. I think there's at least three movies where he is playing the dual role. Fuck, that's good. Which is fantastic. The only Van Damme story I know is he was in Melbourne um, promoting something and it was at an event where Steve Quartermain, the sports commentator, was at as well and Van Damme was uh, trying to uh, chat up Steve Quartermain's wife oh. and Quartermain went over to him and, and uh, maybe knocked him out or something. No. Really? Steve Quartermain. Steve Quartermain. Is that, is that true? Something like that. He knocked out Van Damme. I might be out. Maybe what? I'm adding a little bit extra there, but it's something like that. That's amazing. Cause, yeah. Also, like, what a weird way to behave. Someone's talking to your wife. <laughs> you don't knock him out. out. <laughs> <laughs> Just mean, go I'm, over and say hello. I, I may be uh, retelling the story badly. Maybe he was either Van Dam was like going beyond just talking, or uh, Quartermain didn't knock him out, or yeah, Quartermain really overreacted to <laughs> two people having a conversation. Or maybe you, you like you play a little rougher than usual because it's Van Dam, and then yeah. it turns out that you, oh no, I've knocked him out. You have to talk. You have to play big a big game because Van Dam. So. So Quarterman comes in with a spinning <laughs> roundhouse. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know the only language Van Dam speaks, well, apart from um, you know English and a few other languages, is action. <laughs> 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 well, that's, that's a, very what funny. a great story. That's a great story. So, um, Joan, she's a morale boost. Everywhere she goes. On the evening of May fourth, when Joan was resting, she suddenly sprang up apparently inspired, and announced that she must go and attack the English. Arming herself, which is basically pulling, grabbing her sign, she hurried <laughs> to an English fort east of the city where she discovered an engagement was already taking place. Ah, oh, that's nice. In that's fact, an engagement party. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, nice. now die. Uh, in fact, the Armagnac soldiers which were on her side were retreating when she got there. Her sudden appearance caused the soldiers to give out a cheer and engage in another assault and they took the fortress. Whoa! So they were they were giving up, but then Joan came and I think that they were like, All right, either we're ashamed or God's on our side, let's go back in there. And wow, they, uh, she really inspires them. Yeah, yeah, seriously. How cool. On the morning of May sixth, she crossed to the south bank of the river and advanced towards another fort. The English immediately evacuated in order to defend a stronger position nearby, but Joan and her French commander, Le Hare, attacked them and took it by storm. Oh. Wow. Joan She's like Gazy when he was the flag bearer at the Olympics. Yeah, oh, very motivating. Just Absolutely. like Australia had one of its best ever Olympics yeah. the year, because they just saw Gazy. Inspirational. Yeah. With the flag. Had nothing to do with it being a... Uh, uh, a Sydney Olympics. Yeah, Sydney, Olympics. yeah, well, you know that yeah. Thorpey was actually thinking of retreating from the pool, but yeah. then Gazy <laughs> came out from the change room yeah. with a flag, and he jumped in and like broke the broke the world yeah. record. Gazy took it too seriously, if I can be honest. <laughs> uh, he would not give back that flag. <laughs> he still and got he it. He did turn up at most events to motivate the Australians, but I mean, the results you cannot argue with. Yeah. Speak for themselves. Exactly right. right. Absolutely. He so. played uh, all these games holding a flag. It yeah. was yeah. quite a feat. Yeah, one handed. Yeah, and he was holding it in his right hand. So he's playing left handed the whole time. And still made a couple of layups. Incredible. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, couple. <laughs> Bit of an, uh, an understatement couple there, mate. Dave. How many layups you've ever made in your life, mate? A couple, literally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joan inspired the locals and the troops, and with French confidence growing, the soldiers attacked one besieged fort after another. So wow. she just. The ball just started rolling because Joan was there. That's amazing. On May 7, Joan was injured by an arrow between the neck and shoulder while holding her banner in a trench, but she kept on fighting regardless. And from her example, the commanders kept fighting what felt like a losing battle. Eventually, the English folded, and the next day, they were seen to be retreating. However, because it was a Sunday, a day of rest, Joan refused to allow them to be pursued. So she said, let them go. It's Sunday. Sunday. We don't fight on Sunday. That's right. I'm having a sleep in. Having a sleep in. I'm going to... Have a little mass, yeah. and then we'll have a roast. We'll watch Insiders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone, snuggle she was, up. She was interested in Australian politics back then. Yeah. She also watched Offsiders. 
And then Offsiders following on. Barry Cassidy was still the host of Insiders at the time. Oh, uh, yeah. God, this was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in her book, Joan of Arc, A Spiritual Biography, Siobhan Nash Marshall, what a great name, points out that the morale boost Joan gave cannot be underestimated. This is a quote. French morale was so low before Joan appeared that they even lost the battles in which they outnumbered the Anglo-Burgundians on a massive scale. Wow. More often than not, they simply preferred to stay off the battlefield. She really kicked their butts. In their French way, they went, oh, we don't want to fight. Uh, but I am le tired. <laughs> exactly. But Joan gets in there and they're like, <laughs> hang on, we can fight even when we're outnumbered. Yeah. The sudden and unexpected victory at Olion opened up a number of strategic possibilities. And many Armagnac leaders pushed to invade Burgundy, basically strike whilst the iron is hot. But Joan advocated that the Armagnac forces should advance without delay towards Reim or Ran to so the Dauphin could be crowned. Because okay. remember, he's got to go to this, this yeah. holy place. To do so, first Joan had to clear the English out of other towns along the Loire River. She did, capturing three bridges on the river. In Jaju, the English retreated to hide in the town's walls, and Joan wrote them a letter asking them to surrender. But they refused. So by the end of the day, the town was taken and the English were utterly defeated. She wrote them a letter. Yeah. She actually wrote... Strongly worded? Yeah. She actually wrote a lot of trash-talking letters saying, God's on my side, surrender on our side, you're, you're heretics, surrender now, and if, you know, you'll be forgiven. But otherwise, you've got the wrath of God coming. She wrote heaps of letters. Whoa. Trash-talking saying... Whoa. The G-Man is with me. Yeah. You dumbasses. Dumbasses. Come on. Again from Britannica, the French and English armies came face to pay, face at Pate on June 18th, 1429. Joan promised success to the French, saying that Charles would win a greater victory that day than in any he'd won so far. The victory was indeed complete. The English army was routed and with it, finally, its reputation for invincibility. Wow. wow. So, like, it's in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, like, the war has fully flipped. Wow. And it's, and it, like, no coincidence, it's been exactly as soon as she came on board. Yeah, and everything she said so far has come true. Wow. Amazing. But some people were still doubting her at this point. For sure. Yeah, they right. always are. But she's been pretty on the money so far. The armies marched across enemy territory and they encountered surprisingly little resistance actually gaining the support of several towns held by the enemy on the way. Wow. So really that is like a rolling ball, like just, uh, just gathering speed. And the ultimate goal and prediction came true when the royal army got to the city of Reims, which opened its gates to the Dauphin. That is, despite supposedly being under control of their enemies, the Anglo-Burgundians. So they just opened the gate and said, come on in. Wow. Charles VII was consecrated as King of France on July 17, 1429, with Joan of Arc standing with her banner not far from the altar. After the ceremony, she knelt before Charles, calling him her king for the first time. Joan of Arc's bold prediction had come true. She did it. That's amazing. It's still, I'm, I don't know if I'm, it feels like I'd always believed, I'm picturing her with the sword, Chopping off heads. Yeah. I feel a little bit like... You're disappointed. Yeah, somehow it's like, ah, <laughs> oh, she's just sort of... She was around with them. Oh, she wasn't as violent as I'd hoped. <laughs> oh, no, isn't that weird? <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I, I'm with I'm like, you. oh, she was, a, the, she was f- with a banner. I don't know. It's still, still cool, but... <laughs> <laughs> You've watched too many action movies. Uh, yeah. I would have liked to uh, have seen her Van Damming it a bit more. <laughs> Or Steve Quartermaining yeah. it a bit more. <laughs> I was going to say, what, hitting on other people's wives? <laughs> I should double check that story before no. the episode's well, I just, over. I googled it and the only... Th- yeah, it's like a... It's a story that goes around. It hasn't been... I couldn't find like genuine reports Britannic on it. hasn't got a page yeah. on it. <laughs> so her prediction had come true, Charles VII, crowned king. She'd been there for him, but he wouldn't always be there for oh. her. Oh my God. Momentum was surely on the side of the French king by this point. There was mounting pressure on him to march to Paris, which even then was the capital of France, and reclaim it. Joan and other commanders pushed for this, but the king hesitated, and instead he actually agreed to a 15-day truce with his enemies, which turned out to be a mere ruse to give them time to fortify Paris. So they were like, oh no, let's have a truce. We're Sweet all good. ruse. Really, it was just to give them time to get to Paris, make it... Way more, way more difficult to take. And then they're like, actually, fight's back on. 
Sorry, oh, did I say truce? <laughs> I meant fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you mishear me? Because I was yelling fuck you. I was yelling fuck you. So fuck that's yous. on you if you missed that. So, oh, so guys. Uh, over to Owen Jaris for Live Life Science. He writes, When the attack on Paris finally happened, the king was hesitant to commit the bulk of his forces to it and it ultimately failed. Furthermore, it happened on September the 8th, which is the birth of the Virgin Mary, something that hurt Joan's image as no f- fighting is supposed to take place on this holy day. Right. So, you know. So, Virgin Mary wasn't born that day. It was like the anniversary of the celebration, right? Yeah, probably. I'm not 100% sure. She's Jesus' mum. So, she's been around. She's, I mean, I think that, yeah. Around. Oh, anniversary. Sorry, I know what you mean. Yes. It's, yeah. It's like a, a. But she was born into the world. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I assume so. So I thought you were saying that her birth was also divine. No, I don't think so. But I think, if I'm remembering Deception. right, her she went up to heaven without dying. I think. I think she's the only person who ever did that. Really? According, you know, according to the beliefs. Oh. So Joseph, am I the ascension? I am I saying that right? So Joseph's wife. I know we got, we've got a few Christian so listeners, and they're probably absolutely screaming at their iPods yeah. right now. But, but so, because uh, I don't know that that part of the story. So Joseph's wife is suddenly pregnant. And then suddenly just goes to heaven. He's left going, what the hell is going <laughs> oh, on? No. For fuck's sake, God, Mary. What the hell? Uh, you, left, you left me to raise the son of God on my own? <laughs> you were no, honestly so <laughs> cool when we were dating. Oh. This is after, I think this is after Jesus dies. Oh, okay. So this is, you know, I think Jesus is left home by this point, as in gone to heaven. Left home. Moved out. The earth. Got a job. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did he ever get a job? Carpenter. 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 Fisherman. Fisherman. Alcohol uh, s- distiller. Delivery man. <laughs> <laughs> His methods were a little unusual. <laughs> uh, Joan wanted to push on, but her hopes were set back when King Charles actually called a truce with the Burgundians, their enemies, and uh, who were the allies of the English. And this lasted until Christmas of that year. From this point on, despite what she had achieved for him, the king would never again back Joan of Arc's efforts. You son of a bitch. By this point, he seemed more determined to be more diplomatic with his enemies and, co- and consolidate what he had so far achieved. She's like, let's crush him. And, he, and he's like, let's make a truce. I'm king, which is what I wanted. I'm all good. So he was yeah. like, I'll, just, I'll, I'll form truces now. And she's like, no, we shouldn't. Right. God saying. Yeah, no, we've got... Surely you'd I'm stick being, with her. I'm well, yeah, he backed yeah. her until it was convenient for him. Like, right. to get what he wanted. To get what yeah. he wanted. And at, at one it feels like he's playing beat the bomb, but he's he's going out early. That ticking clock hasn't yeah. got, or beat the bomb or the uh, the bong game. This is, was referenced on the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire episode. Yes. Where on the radio game where they'd say, $10, tick, 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 tick. $20, tick, tick. Thirteen dollars, tick 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 tick. Boom. Tick tick tick. A hundred dollars, tick 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 tick. You've been crowned king. Tick 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 tick. And was it like Money Mountain? Yeah, Money. No, Money Mountain was the early version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Anyway, I don't know why I've taken us there. I apologise. Hey, let's let's relive some other recent reports. Tick 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 tick. At one point, King Charles even disbanded his army. He's like, Ah, we're good now. Yeah, right. And it turns out, even when you're sent by God and everyone reveres you, if you don't have the king on your side, it's pretty impossible to raise armies for major attacks. That's what Joan found. In 1430, Joan heard that John of Luxembourg, the captain of the Burgundian Company, who's their enemies, had laid a siege to the city of Compiègne, and Joan and a few hundred soldiers rushed to defend it. Mm. But the Anglo-Burgundian forces were far larger than her own, because she's got no official army backing now. She tried to aim the town's defenders by launching hit-and-run guerrilla attacks, but Joan and her soldiers were eventually forced to retreat. But she was thrown from her horse and was left outside the town's gates as they closed. What? The Burgundians under John, the Duke of Luxembourg, took her captive. And from here, Joan was imprisoned by the Burgundians at uh, Beauvoir Castle. So she's riding into town on a horse, gets thrown from the horse, and the... They just close the gates. Yeah. And nobody thinks, oh, Joan's just outside the gates there. Joan's outside, but it's as the enemy is basically getting there. Everyone's retreating. It's absolute chaos. And unfortunately, yeah, the the gates close and she's got nowhere to run. So she's taken captive. And she's, she's, yeah. 
Whoa. And a website I found, Matt, you'll be pleased with this. I'm guessing it's French. So I've got some Yeah, track. okay. It's a, I think it's pronounced, and apologies for all the fr- French mispronunciations. I looked up a lot. I, I did Google this one. I think it's wikipedia.org. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, sound quite I French. I assume it's a French website. A lot of information on this French person. Oh, awesome. In English, though. Oh, that's so, so, that's so convenient. convenient. So convenient. it translated it for you. Yeah, and they write, uh, Joan made several escape attempts on one occasion jumping from her 70 foot or 21 meter tower landing on the soft earth of a dry moat after which she was moved to another burgundy in I town. would still be breaking every bone in my body yeah apparently she was uninjured what Can you believe that 21 meters oh well I feel like you know God's on her side yeah God's do you think cushioned that yeah I, I think that too is amazing but it's um yeah, what was I mean? Was the fall softened by any sort of cushions? Yeah, the cushion of God. Oh, she <laughs> landed in God's cushion factory, <laughs> the softest cushion factory of all. And you're thinking she's captured. Surely, Charles the Seventh, the king, the man whom she'd basically made king. Surely he'll do whatever he can to rescue her. Don't tell me what I'm thinking. <laughs> but I was thinking that. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Well, by this time, he was working towards a truce with the Duke of Burgundy, and he made no attempts to save her. He sounds like a real dog. Yeah. Mm. This is, like this a is low a dog. Real French dog. A French do- bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> no a, lower dog There's a that. dog on the no throne. No lower dog. Dash hounds would be lower yeah. to the ground. There's a Daxi on the throne. John, the Duke of Luxembourg, who'd captured her, she, he was initially reluctant to hand her over to the English. But he was eventually paid a small fortune and went, all right, wow. that's my price. They and gave him $10. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Let's hear it play out. $20. <laughs> $10 million. <laughs> Damn, it. Damn it. Oh, Damn it. <laughs> hey, that's still $10 so you didn't have at the start yeah, of the that's day, right. you know? I came here with nothing. It's 10 extra bucks. You exactly. always hear people say that before they lose a lot of yeah. money. I came here with nothing. But you've got money now. Yeah. If you leave now without money... Ten dollars. Yeah. Oh no, I couldn't possibly walk away from this, Eddie, with thirty-two thousand dollars. That would be so embarrassing for me. <laughs> I gave me with nothing. I'll leave you with nothing. Dave, did you apply for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? No, there were there was a call out though. Oh, I really thought you were going to do it, Dave. Please, you should do it, for Dave. All of us. Oh, I fail on the first question, it'll be highly embarrassing. Yeah. We won't tell anyone if you fail. No. But- well, no. who will you, who would you take as your person in the audience? Do you, oh. Genuinely, would doesn't have you to be one of come? us. Would you want to come? Sure. It would be more fun if one of you came. For me. <sighs> All right, we'd, we'd probably do a, a toss of the, tossing of the coin. Or right. you'd want I'll go in because you want Jess on the phone, a friend. Oh yeah, because I can type fast. They don't let you do that anymore. Can you believe? There's no, there's, there's no, no phone, a friend. No, th- I think there's one lifeline, which is like you can switch out a question. Right. I think you only get that. If you're the fastest finger first, maybe. I don't know. Oh, but, you got um, fast fingers too, Dave. But you can't. Game's made for you. You can't uh, phone a friend. And the person in the crowd, they don't have to answer anything. You, Eddie would say, oh, G'day, uh, Dave. Great to have you here. And you're here with your business partner, Matt. Something <laughs> like that. Business partner. That's how you see me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, you don't. do you want him to say you're here with your podcast that's co-host? What, that's, no. what was, that's what I was thinking, my podcast no, co-host. No, I, I, what about friend? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, we're not making up terms here. <laughs> Don't, Matt, no one's going to believe that. No You're one's going to look at you two old man. and say, oh, they're clearly <laughs> friends. Obvious friends. We say, oh, Dave, you're here with your grandpa. Yeah. That's you're nice of you to bring in your grandpa on his last days. Here yeah, with your grandfather, Matt. his wish. Close to death. If you introduced, if I wrote on the form, you or my grandfather, do you reckon a producer would take you aside and say, "Sorry, are you really his gra- grandpa?" Yeah. Oh yeah, I had a, I, I had Dave's father at a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great skincare routine. Yeah, I'd love to share it with you. Podcast I just dress host young. Would be so funny. <laughs> I yeah. dye my beard, but <laughs> under here it is Wrinkle City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't look at my back. That's where I keep it's all, all the wrinkles. Back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's just got a bunch of like little got clips, a, yeah, bulldog clips bulldog on the early back. French bulldog clips. <laughs> and we're back. And we're back in France. So <laughs> she's been handed over to the English. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, who have, she's caused a lot of trouble for them. Yeah, they'd hate her. Yeah, oh, yeah. 
Because, I mean, she's also proof that God's not on their side. Yeah, so they are hell-bent on proving that she wasn't acting on the behalf of God and that she's, in fact, a heretic and that God's on their side. Right. So they put her on trial, which was funded by the English Crown and was only ever going to go one way. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the words of British... I'm sorry, could you give us the phone number for God if you guys are so close? Didn't think so. Proved it. Proved it. Put him on. Put him on. Put him well, on. So what it sounds like is, I mean... if. God could prove it, right, in this court case. But it sounds like like the king did. Now God's kind of leaving her hanging out to dry. But this whole time she's thinking, God's going to come in and save me. Yeah, why well, wouldn't... And But I guess even if God did some sort of miracle, the English would be like, no, that was just... Uh, wind. Wind. Yeah, that was special effects. <laughs> yeah. It's got, actually got really advanced these days. You've got people... With puppets yeah. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a deep fake yeah. yeah that's Jim Henson That's not God yeah. Even though he's really good I mean he's great He's the god he's of good. puppeting Sure yeah. But we're talking more like Big guy in the sky yeah, God of gods <laughs> Like the god I can't <laughs> believe I have to say that Yeah god. <laughs> Sorry Were you talking about Jim Henson This whole time <laughs> <laughs> Yeah Jim Henson was telling me Where this uh, sword would be He saw it there the other day uh, In the words of British medievalist Which is a great title Beverly Boyd Beverly Boyd. The trial was meant by the English Crown to, quote, be a ploy to get rid of a bizarre prisoner of war with maximum embarrassment to their enemies. That's all they want. A legal proceedings kicked off in January 1431. Her two judges were Corchon, Bishop of Beauvoir, and Jean Lemaitre, the Vice Inquisitor of France. She was interrogated nearly a dozen times. They considered torture to get her to confess but decided against it because she was so steadfast in her beliefs they thought it would be pointless. Okay. She was so where do you go when you start with torture? They're like, uh... We've ruled out torture. Yeah, exactly. Like, wait, So if you go, okay, we're going to torture, no, it's not going to work. We're, we're we're s- what's above that? Yeah, uh, we'll skip that and just call her guilty. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they actually tried uh, to outsmart her. They tried to... Because she, she's very... She's got great answers for why she It'd acts on It'd be so good and if it ends up... They're like, I oh, see so you really are with God. We probably should not uh, yeah. have you captured any more then. Is there any chance you could be on our side? Yeah. Because if God's Please. on your side, then you're on our side. Then God's on our side now. That'd be Great. awesome. We'd love that. If you could put in a good word. Wouldn't you be sc- I've done some bad shit. Wouldn't you be scared that like this person who... It, yeah. It seems has, there's nowhere. been a lot of really good evidence that God is on her side... Why would you be awful to her? Because then God's going to punish you. But then Maybe the, but you're they, the devil. They don't want to, but no one wants to believe that they're yeah. the evil ones. Oh, wait, wait, are we the evil ones? No. We, we couldn't be. No, I'm so nice. No, we, we've said our king's got God on his side. Yeah. My, my whole life I've been told that I'm on the right side and they're on the wrong side. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. So that can't be. That can't be right. Yeah. Uh, Judge Corshon forbade her to leave her prison to go to mass, but Joan insisted she was morally free to attempt escape. So she several times tried to escape. (laughs) Guards were then assigned to remain always inside her cell, and she was chained to a wooden block and sometimes put in irons. So she had uh, pretty pretty bad conditions. To properly describe her charges, I will quote from Britannica, which does have a great article on Joan, will of course link to in the show notes. But they write, When the trial proper began a day or so later... It took two days for Joan to answer the 70 charges that had been drawn up against her. These were based mainly on the contention that her behaviour showed blasphemous presumption. In particular, that she claimed for her pronouncements the authority of divine revelation, prophesied the future, endorsed her letters with the name of Jesus and Mary, remember she's always writing letters, thereby identifying herself with the novel and suspect cult of the name of Jesus. Uh, But perhaps the most serious charge was of preferring what she believed to be in the direct command of gods to those of the church. Basically, they're saying, you can't say that you're talking to God. You're not. Yeah. That's a lie. So that's one of the charges. Wow. Uh, The judges tried to catch her out in the trial, and yet, despite the fact that she was an illiterate peasant, they thought they could easily uh, outmaneuver her. But she was able to evade the theological pitfalls the tribunal had set up to entrap her. An example Look of over there. <laughs> God, she's good. Okay, she is very good. An example of which is published on that French website, wikipedia.org. <laughs> They're right. The, the transcript of the trials 
are still around, which is what? amazing. There's still first sources on this. That's amazing. Amazing. There's a lot of info on Joan of Arc, which is part one of the reasons that she's is because she's super famous, but that also adds to her fame because there's a lot of resources yeah, on it. Yeah, wow. Uh, the transcript's most famous exchange is an exercise in subtlety. Asked if she knew she was in God's grace, she answered, If I am not, may God put me there. And if I am, may God so keep me. I should be the saddest creature in the world if I knew I were not in his grace. Uh, so this question is a scholarly trap. Church doctrine held that no one could be certain of being in God's grace. Right. So if she answered yes, then she would be charged with heresy. Because right. you're not allowed to say that. If she answered no, then she would have confessed her own guilt because she knows that she hasn't been acting on behalf yeah, okay. of God. So she says, if I am not, may God put me there. If I am... May God so keep So me. she doesn't say she yes or no. She didn't say yes or no. And yes, like, damn it. <laughs> yes. Damn it, she's good. Wow. So she's really good at like yeah. sort of outmaneuvering their maneuvers. And they've got like teams of like scholarly people and religious leaders all trying to catch her out because they, they need to prove that she's yeah. a heretic. Do they think that she's just doing that instinctively or, or she is outsmarting them back? Uh, or God's... Telling her that, I guess. Well, I guess, and she, she's just so religious that she knows the right, the right answer. She's because, so religious. Like, well, she just, you couldn't even yeah. be any more religious than she is. She's super religious. And what I mean by that is like she, I guess it is instinctively knows because in her heart she's never acted, never done anything wrong. Right. She's always been acti- acting on what she believes is the, is the right way and what God would want her to. Uh, the trial continued, and because she handled herself so well, the 70 charges had to be reduced to 12. Wow, that's a big drop. Because they're like, all right, uh, we can't get her on all these things because she's really smart. Uh, we'll just reduce we'll it to 12. Got and then her we'll, on tax evasion, we'll pin her yeah. on that. Uh, speeding in a, in a school zone. Yeah. Honestly, one of the biggest things, because she couldn't really deny it, was that she'd been dressing in men's clothing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, she's she was wearing khaki the at the time. Charges. Yeah, that was one of the things. They got her on that. It is a bit like tax evasion or that stuff. Not because you said you were acting on behalf of God, but because we've got proof that you're in men's clothing and that is a sin. And she can't really get out of that one. That's baffling. Wild. Uh, Joan fell sick in prison and was attended to by two doctors. She received a visit on April 18 from Cor Sean and his assistants who exhorted her to submit to the church. They keep saying, just say that you're wrong, say that you're wrong. Joan, who was seriously ill and thought she was dying, begged to be allowed to go to confession and receive Holy Communion and to be buried in consecrated ground. They continued to badger her, receiving her only constant response, which is, I am relying on our Lord. I hold to what I have already said. She just kept saying that. And they kept saying, admit it, admit it. And she she thinks she's dying. She just never, never drops. Uh, Joan was informed that if she persisted with her answers and denials, she would be turned over to the secular authorities. Only they, and not the church, could carry out the death sentence of a condemned heretic. So they're like, all right, if you're not going to play ball with us, we'll give you to them and they will execute you. Oh, they wanted to play ball. Just play ball with them. She hates ball games. Take a break from all this stuff. Yeah, just play go ball. and have a kick. It's fun. Have a chuck. Have a chuck. Go and have a chuck. It'll do you the world of good. They keep throwing balls at her, hoping that she'll just catch one. Got her. Got she it. caught it. Got her, she played ball. But instead it just keeps hitting her in the face. How old is she? Is this still the year she was 16? She's now 19 years 19. old. So she crammed a lot in. All her, all, all her famous stuff happened so quickly. Mm. Yeah. So she's not cracking, but finally she does. When her judges began to read out the sentence, abandoning her to the secular power, saying, all right, fine, you're going to go to them, fine. That's cool, whatever. Hey, hey we'd love... To help you, yeah, yeah. But, but you got to help yourself. Yeah, Sorry, yeah you got to help us or we, we won't help you. Upon hearing this, Joan called out and then said that she would do all the church required of her. Understandably, she was probably afraid of being executed, which at this time means being burnt to death. It's not a good one. Th- this whole time she's had faith in God that God will intervene and save her and now she's basically told, all right, you're going to be murdered. She was presented with a form of confession and although she hesitated in signing it, eventually she put her name on the condition that it was pleasing to our lord she's like all right well god's not saving me maybe this is the right thing to do right so instead of the death sentence because she signed she was condemned to what we would call life imprisonment wow all right they say we won't kill you but you are never leaving jail is this in england or this is in english france oh this is in english france right uh the vice inquisitor had ordered joan to put on women's clothes and she obeyed the command 
But two or three days later, this is after the confession, when the judges and others visited her and found her again in male attire, she said she'd had a change of her own free will, preferring men's clothes. This has actually been disputed. Others claimed that they've actually, they actually took away her female clothing and left only men's clothes so they could set her up. Yeah, right. Why? They've already got her. Why do they? Yeah, like, want what more to? do you want? Because it, it's been speculated that some people are like, no, no, we've got to kill not her. Enough. We've got to kill this woman. Yeah, okay, it's not enough to imprison her for life. We have to make sure she dies. Yeah, in case that she inspires f- future rebellion. But the common narrative is, and probably the most widely believed, this, is that she she'd heard the voices of Saint Catherine and Saint Margaret, who told her off for signing her name and admitting she acted improperly. Right. So she basically went back on her own signing and said. I withdraw my right. I withdraw my confession. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't make sense that her staying alive would inspire people. Don't they, don't they normally try and avoid martyring someone on the other side yeah. to because that's what really inspires them? Yeah, you would think so. Yeah, that's true. Though she might come back and lead another army, who knows. Sadly for Jones, so she said actually I withdraw my confession. Uh, uh the the voices have come back and uh I was wrong. I was right. <laughs> Basically, I was wrong. I was right. I was wrong. I was I wrong to sign. I was right. Sadly for Joan, this was the final straw, and she was handed over to the dreaded secular officials. The next day, she was condemned to death. Tied to a tall pillar, she was burned at the stake. Whoa. That day. The, yeah, the next day after she wow. was handed over. Beforehand, a member of the Roman Catholic Order comforted Joan, and she asked him to hold a crucifix high enough for her to see from the platform and to shout out the assurances of salvation so loudly that she could hear them over the roar of the flames. As the fire was lit and spread, she uttered her last words, which were, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Repeating Christ's name several times before her death, uh, and like I said, she was only 19. She was only 19. Can you believe it? You're only meant to blow the bloody doors off. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus. I mean, yeah, it's hot. Jesus, Jesus, that's hot. (laughs) I think mine would be a little a uh, little stronger, but no. sorry, didn't mean to laugh at a woman being burnt to death. That is horrendous. It is absolutely. Obviously. After she died, the English raked back the coals to expose her charred body so no one could c- claim that she had escaped. Oh, my God. They then burnt the body twice more to reduce it to ashes and to cl- prevent any collection of relics and then uh, cast her remains into the Seine River so no one could ever have like a like a – burial spot yeah. or place to, for people to gather. Gotcha. I mean, you can still have those even without the body being yeah. there, you know, little plaque. That's true. But I think it's the same with Hitler. They're like, burn the shit out of it, throw it in a river so no one can be like, this is where his body is. Yeah. Now it's just in the water. Now That's it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's probably out to sea. Yeah, he spread that all around the world by this point. The ocean's full of Hitler. Well, <laughs> Great. I'm swimming in Hitler. <laughs> I'm oh, swimming in Hitler. Right, now everything's ruined. <laughs> I'm up to my bloody eyeballs in Hitler. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Hitler. <laughs> just wanted to see oh, some tropical no. fish. They're just surrounded by Hitler. God, I've just swallowed some Hitler. Oh, no. Whoa, so <laughs> salty. Having a Hitler break, sorry, drinks break. <laughs> so the Hundred Year War raged on for 22 years after Joan of Arc's death. Charles the Seventh, the king she'd helped and who'd done nothing to help her, retained legitimacy as the king of France... He's my least favourite French king now. You hate him? He's, yeah, dog. So he was, yeah, he retained legitimacy despite r- the rival coronation of Henry the Sixth, who was once a baby, um, like many of us. Uh, at the <laughs> <laughs> some skip that stage. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was actually crowned at Notre Dame Cathedral. Notre Dame in fourteen thirty one. With the back. Can you believe it? Notre Dame. Uh, there's lots of contributing factors, but like I said earlier, Henry VI, the baby king, grew up to be a terrible ruler and was a big reason that England ultimately lost the Hundred Years' War to the French. Even marrying Charles VII's niece, Margaret of Anjou, didn't stop Charles from taking back more and more of France. He kept going until the French victor- victory at the Battle of Castillon in 1453, by which time Charles VII had control of most of France. Through conquest and marriage alliances, Charles VII was able to bring such regions as Burgundy, Provence and Brittany together into one nation state that was richer and more powerful than ever. Wow. That's the end of the Hundred Years' War, but soon back in England, Henry VI would have to deal with another influential series of events on his own doorstop, the so-called Wars of the Roses, which is another epic topic that I'd love to do someday. Maybe my next two, if not three parts. What? Story. Wow. 
Maybe block, Big one. block 2022. It's, it's only months away now, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> if, wow. people, if people vote for it, I'll do it. Battle of the Roses. But what about the legacy of Joan of Arc? Mm. I guess despite turning his back on her, Charles VII was still thinking about her because almost 20 years after her execution, on his entry, entry into Rouen in 1450, Charles VII ordered an inquiry into the trial. Oh. The trial that had uh, found her guilty and executed her. The conviction of Joan of Arc in 1431 was posthumously investigated on appeal at the request of Joan's surviving family, her mother Isabel and, and two of her brothers, Jean and Pierre. And the appeal was authorised by the then Pope, Pope Calixtus III. Calixtus. Never, never, th- never heard of him, but no. I love it. Uh, the purpose of the retrial was to investigate whether the trial of condemnation and its verdict had been handed justly and according to ecclesiastical law. The Inquisitor's final summary of the case in June 1456 described Joan as a martyr and implicated the late Pierre Cauchon, who was the judge, mm. with heresy for having convicted an innocent woman in pursuit of a secular vendetta. Wow. So the, the the court declared her innocent on July the seventh, fourteen fifty six, and they said the guy that found her guilty, he's actually the guilty one. Right. So and did he get burned alive? I'm actually not sure if he was. I'm sure he was dead by this point, but let's look him up because I forgot to do that. So this is fourteen fifty six. He died in fourteen forty two, so he never oh, never damn. got his comeuppance. I mean, he's t- <laughs> here I am, like, oh damn it, he still died. Yeah, he still died. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you want him to hear that he's wrong and he's guilty. Yeah, he was posthumously excommunicated. But he did not did not die. There you go. Well, he, he did die, he did but die. Not, 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 yeah. not for that crime. Yeah. Uh, Joan of Arc, so she was found not guilty in 1456, a mm-hmm. long time ago. But she became a symbol of the Catholic League during the 16th century. But it wasn't until 1920, almost 500 years after her death, that she was canonised. Wow. I mean, they do take ages. It takes ages. Yeah. Oh, admin, it takes red so tape. Yeah. Oh, so much red tape. A lot of paperwork. You've got other stuff to do. It's not like top of the list. Wow, that 1920. 1920. Her feast day is May 30. The French Parliament on June 24, 1920, decreed a yearly national festival in her honour that is held the second Sunday in May. And in France, she is known as La Pucelle de Orléans, a.k.a. The Maid of Orléans. That's awesome. So much of the original oh, source... I just had a look over your shoulder there, Dave. So Orléans, is, that's where New Orleans is named after, is it? I imagine so, because it is spelt Orleans with an accent on the E. Yeah, right. There you go. Uh, so much of the original source material of her trial survives that it's been said that no person of the Middle Ages, male or female, has been the subject of more study. Yeah. So there's heaps of actual first sources... Uh, stuff that survived. Uh, the fascination with this teenage peasant that came from absolutely nowhere, who changed the course of one of the most influential wars in, in history, has captured the human imagination for centuries. During World War I, French troops carried an image of her into battle with them, and three separate vessels of the French Navy have been named after her, including a helicopter carrier, which I think we can all agree is the best tribute she could ever <laughs> hope for. I think that's why she did lol. <laughs> Number one, for God. Number two. <laughs> for, for the helicopter carrier. Yeah. To be named after her. Uh, that is my report on La Pucelle, the maid of Orléans, Jean d'Arc. Well done, Dave. Great stuff. Firstly, question for you two. What vessel would you want to have named after you? <laughs> vessel? Ooh. Like a Ooh. pint? Jug? Tugboat. Oh, that's okay. a good one. That is good. You that's want a pretty... jug? Do you want it to be shaped like you? Like... So, like the Jesus yes. jugs? Yes, yeah, so I want to be like a t- one of those Toby jugs with your face on it. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be sick. All right, I'll arrange that for you. If you could get onto that tugboat, that'd be good. <laughs> Thank you, I will. I'll uh, absolutely call 1-800-TUGBOAT. <laughs> <laughs> for the theists out there who were yelling at their iPods, I've looked up the assumption. Well, I think I called it the ascension. Assumption of Mary versus Dormition. Oh, no. To assume it makes an ass out of you and me. Exactly. This is on that uh, French page. This might might be French-related Christianity, but it says, uh, Many Catholics believe that Mary first died before being assumed, but they believe that she was miraculously resurrected before being assumed. 
assume I think means going up to heaven. Mm -hmm. Others believe she was assumed bodily into heaven without first dying. Either understanding may be legitimately held by Catholics, with Eastern Catholics observing the feast as the Dormition, which is her dying first, I think. So let me just say that I, you can't be wrong because no one can agree. No, yeah, even inside Catholicism, it looks like it's disputed. Wow. I'm sure. But I'm guessing I must have been taught that she went up f- full-bodied. I'm sure a war's been fought over that fact. Yeah, important stuff. Important stuff. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for that reply. It was great. I think um, I wish it wasn't my main takeaway that she was a flag bearer <laughs> and not a flag. Yeah. In my head, she was like. She was out in front chopping heads, but so, you, so like your your Ed Heckler honorary flag bearer. Bullshit. No, I, d- I don't know. I don't know why. It just feels like. I mean, it's it's amazing what she did anyway. Just to talk her way into yes. kind of going around with the army. It is isn't like a sixteen year old can just rock up and be like, oh, I've t- I've spoken to the saints, and then march into an unwinnable battle, and yeah. then they actually end up winning. Even if that, yeah. it's just amazing. That that it did incredible. change the course of the war, which was like a massive event in European history. So. Yeah, so I, I imagine, you know, people would believe in that. The other side of it is it's possible like the uh, Space Jam, uh, Michael's Special Juice or whatever it was called, <laughs> where he'd, or my confu- that might be confusing slightly, Michael Jackson's much more awful thing. But in um, the uh, Space Jam, Michael had a bottle and he said, this is my special drink. This is why I play so well and all the Looney Tunes drink it, but it yeah. turns out it's just water, but they yeah. all play better because of it. She might have been their Absolutely. Michael Jordan special Bit water. Of placebo. I reckon no yeah. one has Also ever- happens in Harry Potter. <laughs> oh, does People it? Just watched all the Harry Potter movies. People have uh, spoken about this uh, lady for 550 years <laughs> and I don't think anyone's ever put in those terms before. Yeah. So well done. For Nobody's <laughs> ever made the Space Jam analogy. <laughs> Putting it into new, uh, into new territory. It's beautiful. Um, well, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show where we thank a lot of our great supporters. You can support us, keep this show running, uh, keep the lights on, if you will. Yeah. It gets dark in here without them. And flicker, flicker. So you can go to patreon.com slash pod or dogoonpod.com and you can support us on a bunch of different levels. There's all sorts of different um, rewards and bonuses you get by supporting us, including three bonus episodes a month. Some that have come out recently, Dave, you're doing them this month. Yes, well, we just had our uh, annual Dugo Honours go out. Oh, the Dugo on Awards. shiny Golden Gary. That's right, for uh, where we get our Patreon supporters to vote for best episode of, the, of uh, 2021, mm-hmm. best host reporter, our best guest host, which we heard from them. Uh, yeah, it's a, lot, it's a lot of fun. It's really Dugo on podcasts, night of nights. It is. It's yeah. so good. And there's every month we do a, a phrase in the bar or about another... Brendan Fraser movie, including one a couple of months ago, was a live one, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, which we've t- recently we we're in the golden age. We, recently, we've had George of the Jungle, Dudley Do Right, The Mummy, and Bedazzled. Oh, oh. It's a good run. It's amazing. It's the big four. Yeah. The big four. We're, we're hitting the peak. We're not far from the Mummy too. So pretty oh good. Oh my god. Uh, but yeah, so there's all sorts of things. One of the rewar- I mean, the Facebook group is the nicest corner of the internet. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Get involved there place. if you sign up. But uh, if you sign up on the Sydney Scheinberg level, uh, you get to give us a fact quote or question as well as all those other things I just mentioned. Uh, And you also get to give yourself a title. I read these out for the first time on the show. Uh, First one this week comes from... Oh, sorry. Before I say that, I think this section has a little jingle, doesn't it? Of course. I don't know if it does. Oh, maybe it doesn't. Fact (laughs) quote or question. Um. (laughs) Ding. <laughs> he always remembers the farm. Uh, so uh, this farm. week, the first one comes from Katie Hopner, and this is Katie's. Oh, sorry, Kate. Kate Hopner. Kate's first time in. No, it isn't. Oh, because I've just seen her title. Uh, you have to give yourself a title as well. And uh, Kate's title is previously known as Kate Mallory. Oh. So I believe Kate Mallory's been in here before. Uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, if you you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question, that's what Kate's done. Or, sorry, or a brag, brag or, or suggestion, suggestion these days as well. Compliment was also uh, oh, yeah. an option. Please, we need them. Kate has been in the in the, uh, in the the fact, quote, or question before, but this is the first time. Welcome in as Kate Hopner. Uh, congratulations on the name change right. for whatever reason. I hope uh, I just decided to turn a new leaf. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah just, just try something new. Thing. Not, nothing wrong with the Mallory, but Hopner, that's a great one. It's great. Both good. 
Both very good. Well done. Hard um, to hyphenate. So, yeah, you, you made a call. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, she could be going back to her name after a divorce. Exactly. Or could be just a change. Whatever reason it is. That's right. Oh. I feel like they're all good reasons. All good reasons. There's no bad reason to change your name. Uh, Witness protection. Yeah, I was going to say. All good. All good. All yeah. good reasons. You're fleeing. Joined danger. The, joined the Screen Actors Guild and they've said, sorry, there's already, there's already a Kate Valerie. Mallory. Yeah. Hope not. Love it. <laughs> so anyway, Kate has offered a question, which is, what is the weirdest food combination you've ever tried? Oh. Kate has answered the question, as I always ask people to do if they ask one. Do you want to hear hers first? Bef- yeah. To yeah, a little bit of thinking time. Thanks. Uh, when I was younger, my grandma introduced me to sandwiches with peanut butter, tomatoes, raw sugar, and salt and pepper. Oh, it okay. sounds awful, but it's pretty tasty. <laughs> I love that it's not brilliant. Yeah. It's pretty tasty. It's pretty yeah. tasty. I think my sister-in-law eats peanut butter and peanut tomato. Peanut butter, tomatoes, raw sugar, and salt and pepper. That does sound like a monstrosity. Yeah, that's that's not for me, thanks. Yeah, I think it's the, for me it's the sugar. Yeah. 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 Take that out, I'll be like, I can I'm, see Yeah, I'm into the rest. I can see it working. And the rest. My This one is... May, it, I don't think it's seen as weird, but... Seemed weird to me before I first had it. Avocado, Vegemite, mm. cheese, and tomato. It's the Vegemite that might, some people might make that yeah. seem weird, but I think but avocado like and salty. Vegemite go so well yeah. together. That works. Um, Dave, can you think of any weird combos? Uh, I can't think of a weird combo. People find it weird that I put sour cream and cheese on my baked beans. That's not weird. It's not, but people sour find sour cream and cream. oh, okay. On baked beans. I don't think that, I think I think that it, works. That they do I, that I, think, I know it works, but I think... I think that the, <laughs> oh, I know it No, that's... Any, but I meant more, I was on your side, mate, but okay. Thanks. No, at but a, some people say... At a music say, festival or something, they'll... They, you know, the Humble Spud sort of vans? Yeah. They do a, like a baked potato. Yeah. And one of the combos is pretty much that. And that works really well. Yeah, I don't okay. think that's weird. Okay. Yeah. I've had people be like, what are you doing, mate? Well, I mean, like, it's not... You're putting, like... Uh, I think sour cream... Is a like a, a fairly neutral. Mm, I love it. Kind of I product. Anything. I don't think mm. it's. You know what I mean? Like it, you're just putting it. I think putting it on something, that's fine. Dave, it's fine. Thanks. Next time somebody has a go at you for that, you just say, "Hey, fuck you." I'm trying to think of it. I will. Well, I, I remember the the only time I remember someone being like, "What are you doing?" I was staying. I was younger. I was like 19. I was staying at a family's friend in the country in Charlton back where I used to live and um, we got up and it was, it was Charlton show day so mm. we were about to go to the show and I was having a, a bowl of cocoa pops with milk yeah. and then a bit of beer on the side Oh, <laughs> and the dad Mick came in he's like what are you doing just putting milk and beer in yeah, the same it time it is a weird I'd say I wouldn't do it now, but back then it just felt like I was living the dream. It's because you're 19 and you're bulletproof. Yeah. Now it's It was like, Charlton Show Day. I was so pumped. Yeah. Now you're like, that's immediately going to upset my stomach. I'm going to shit myself. <laughs> you know, I have to think about what I'm eating now because I'm like, oh, that usually gives me acid reflux. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're not as bulletproof as you were. Yeah. That, that doesn't that ring any bells for you, Dave. That's a bit cruel. Cocoa Pops and beer is pretty good. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm as, actually... As like it's a, actually... I mean... Summertime here in Australia, I might give it a go one morning. Yeah, give it a crack. I can't think of many, mostly because I was uh, um, quite a fussy eater as a kid and weird combos of foods, it was never going to happen. Still, a little. uh, I think I'm the same. I'm pretty basic, sorry. On the stupid old, did either of you watch the, I mean, you were both on it, but the stupid old uh, fundraising telethon? Yeah. Towards the end, Reese Nicholson came on to make a jaffle. That's right. And so he's making it with bolognese and cheese and stuff. And Andy's hosting, Andy Matthews is hosting at the time. And he mm. and he's like, oh, this is a weird combination. I haven't heard of anyone putting bolognese in a jaffle. And everyone else is like, well, that's pretty standard. <laughs> yeah, that he's was... like, what are you talking about? N- normal jaffle's got grated cheese uh, and grated carrot. And I was like, what? what? Oh, okay. <laughs> Andy, Andy, Andy. <laughs> Yeah. Grated cheese and grated carrot. Yeah, I think that's what he said. Every, carrot and sandwich. Just everyone, and then cook it. Everyone was like, what? And he's like, that's what we did on our holidays. Well, your family's wrong. <laughs> and then someone's like, he's, he, Reese was like, where, where, wait, where did you grow up? And 
And Andy said Tasmania or everyone. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, you can still watch that if you want to see that beautiful moment on the stupid old channel on YouTube. The only thing I can think of that I ate a lot as a kid that I don't think I'd really want to eat now was just a sandwich that just had cheese, mayonnaise and lettuce. It's not that like it's not that ridiculous. It's basically like yeah. a McChicken without the chicken, you know. Like <laughs> yeah. it's not a crazy combo. But now I'm like, oh, can I could have put a bit more substance in that yeah. sandwich. I it mean, that sounds like that's a fresh yeah. summer sandwich. Um, great question, Kate. You've really got us thinking yeah. there. Yeah. Um, if uh, if anyone out there's got some, tweet at us and see if we remember this conversation. We won't. But especially in the, send do it, it in, our way. if you're in the Patreon group, especially get get a thread going. Thanks for that question, Kate. Next one comes from Isaac Spirat. And I believe, I've, I was wrong when I said about Kate, but I believe this is Isaac's first time. Welcome, the, Isaac. F- that quote a question. And Isaac uh, has given himself the title Assistant Chief Do Go On Petting Zoo Attendant. Ooh. Oh, very important. Good to have you here in case that little baby goat gets a little bitey. <laughs> it's another food related one. Uh, Isaac has asked the question, what's your favourite chicken piece from KFC? If you're vego, I think Bop is. Shit, now I'm not sure. What's your favourite vego junk food? Oh. So, favourite chicken piece? My favourite fast food, if I want, if you want me to jump in while you're thinking, uh, is Subway, I reckon. That's my go-to. Subway. Subway, dark rye, all the salads, avocado. That's probably my... That's your favourite fast food. Oh, no, not fast food, but my favourite chain. Oh, okay, chain. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, still, that's like, still I, surprising. I do like maybe the Hungry Jack's Whopper. The okay. Because ve- I'm... Uh, oh, Zach, I'm a veggie as well. Sorry to bang on about it, but... Um, <laughs> how do you, how do you bloody know? They do a... I love the, the Rebel Burger at Hungry Jack's as well. Um, I know a lot... Yeah, that's probably my go-to bad, bad food, but fast food in general, pizza... Yeah. Fish and chips. Fish and, chippies, fish and chips is chippies. my number Been getting one. right back in a Friday night fish and chips. Oh, that's fun. Reliving my childhood. You're very nostalgic. What about Thursday afternoon lunch fish and chips? Ooh. AKA after this episode. Love that. Love that as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind that one bit. Don't mind that one bit. Okay. Uh, as the one of the three that does eat chicken at the moment, I am a fan of... Popcorn chicken. Oh, yeah. Ooh, popcorn that sounds chicken. like that would probably be good. Though my favorite, that for a very long time. favorite thing that KFC ever did was potato mashies. Oh, which yeah. is basically fried balls of mashed potato. Oh, KFC's that's nice. one I just never, I, I never really ate KFC. Nah, me we were, McDonald's was a treat as a kid. Yeah, and it was. And I had junior burgers. I would eat, which is like the nothing burger, but I would go and when I was like a teenager, go see a movie or whatever, and I'd go to the McDonald's, I'll say, Five junior burgers, <laughs> chips, and a strawberry thick shake. I think it was my go-to. That's a good. That's a good combo. It's just like, can I just have a loaf of bread? Yeah, <laughs> give me all and your five bread. patties of. of yeah, we beef. yeah same. We would have like chips. You'd you'd go through the McDonald's drive-through on the drive home from Ballarat visiting family, and you'd get like a little. You'd get a, a, a little fries. That was about it. And then as a teen, as my friends ate more sort of junk food stuff, but KFC wasn't one that I got around a lot either. And now not eating meat. I like their chips a lot. Good chips. Yeah. I think just hot chips is probably my hot chips. My yeah. fave. Hot I'm not chips fussy where they're from. Just give them to me. Had a country road trip recently and, yeah, the country uh, fish and chip chips. Oh. I don't know how they taste different. It's like the, the potato's creamier or something. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. Mm. It's magic. Yeah. yeah. It's your secret out there in the country. They won't share it with tell the us. city folk. <laughs> tell, tell us. I used to be one of you. Huh? Come nah, on. Not, you've been a city boy for too long. Since the last millennium. Uh, thank you very much for that question, Isaac. I think chips, we can all agree. We yeah, love chips. Yeah, chips, number one. My goodness. Uh, next one comes from t- Tom Quinders. I believe another first timer. And Tom... Has given himself the title of background dancer for performances at the Triptych Club. Oh, that's fun. And Every good band needs a backup dancer. Yeah, agreed. Tom has offered a fact. Hi, Jess, Matt and Dave. While listening to the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire episode, something happened that made me upgrade to this level just to tell you this fact. Oh, wow. In Germany... You can we- just email us. <laughs> <laughs> huh. so you could tweet it, but this would take a, few, a couple of tweets. Yeah. 
uh, says, in Germany, we also have Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which is hosted by Gunther Jorch. Dave, you're the German of the group. How do you pronounce that? Absolutely nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is yelling at his iPod <laughs> right now. Sorry, Tom. Uh, in 2015, a man named Leon Winshield, no, Winshield, won the million dollars <laughs> during the show. He said that if he won enough money, he was planning to buy a party boat and operate it as a business in Munster. Uh, Leon had promised Gunther during the show that he was going to name the boat after him. And Gunther, in turn, promised to be the boat's godfather since he himself was born in Munster. <laughs> Am I saying Munster, right? Yeah, I think so. It's got the umlaut over the U. I think it changed it from Munster to Munster. Yeah, didn't we have... Maybe. Isn't this... When your brother-in-law yelled out <laughs> yeah. during the uh, Monster Rebellion sh- show, live show? Yeah, someone yelled out. So- yeah, that's right. Uh, so he says, This plan was made reality in 2016 and now the MS Gunther docks in Monsters Harbour. That's nice. <laughs> that's so good. I love that. I bring this up because I live in Munster and while biking to dance training, oh, I love that sentence. Love this. I was listening to the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire episode and passed the boat at the bridge crossing. Then on my way back from training an hour later, still listening to the episode, I passed it in the same spot again, this time coming from the other side. I took it as a sign of fate and decided I must tell you this fun question mark fact. That is a fun fact. Love you all. That's so good. That's actually, that's re- that's quite wholesome too. That's a nice interaction that happened. Yeah, Like, I I'm going to name a boat after you. Well, consider me the boat's grand- godfather. <laughs> That's so nice. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's so nice. I think I want Gunther George as our host. Yeah, it's good. Get Gunther over here. Get him on. I feel like he's a can-do guy. I'd be like, yeah. Of course. I'll come over. Yeah, no worries. Oh, you want to host Australia? Australia? Sure. All right. Fuck Eddie McGuire, he said. Oh, not my words. No, my words. Gunther Never said my it. words. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. That is a fantastic debut or debut into the fact quota questions. Uh, fact you nailed suggestion. it. Suggestion. No. Brag. Um, finally, this week, uh, come. this one's from Returner, Jeremy Swade, which I think we've said in the past. What a name. Incredible. What a smooth name. Yeah. Jeremy's title is Grand Dugan Ambassador Extraordinaire, uh, Plenipotentiary to California. What's a plenipotentiary? It's a cool word. That's I what it know. is. Maybe, will they explain? Maybe. Let's find out. Uh, Jeremy's offering us a fact, which is California is home to the porn capital of the world, the San Francisco Valley, also known as Porn Valley, Silicon Silicon Valley, or San Pornado Valley. What's the Silicon Valley pun? Porn Valley, Silicon Valley. Is that different how you spell silicon? Yes, yeah, different spelling. Silicone. Oh, maybe it's meant to be Silicon Valley? No, whatever. All right. Um... San Pornado Valley is very funny. Although the number has declined in recent years, at one time, nearly 90% of all legally distributed pornographic films made in the US were produced in San Fernando Valley, San Fernando Valley based studios. The film Boogie Nights, starring Mark Wahlberg, explores many aspects of the area and is very true to the nature of the industry during the 70s and 80s. So I guess this is kind of a fact and a brag because where I live, Woodland Hills, is part of the San Pana- Pornando Valley. Hmm. Lucky me. <laughs> nice one. Jeremy Swade. I mean, that does sound like it could be a porn name. That's a good porn name. Uh, thank you very much for that fact, Jeremy Swade. Should, do you want me to look up Planet Plenipotentiary? Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, uh, silicon and silicone are two very different things, so that was a good uh, oh, was so a play. What is silicone? Uh, in short, silicon is a natural occurring element, whereas silicone is a synthetic substance. Oh, maybe some of them might a dildo might be made out yeah, of. Yeah, I think that's what he's. Uh, I get going it. Going for it there. <laughs> uh, plenipotentiary is a diplomat diplomat who has full powers, authorization to sign a treaty or convention convention on behalf of his or her sovereign. There you go. Wow. Hey, pretty important. That's Love a, that. That's a big role. Happy to see those powers over, mate. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, another thing we like to do is thank a few of our other supporters. Jess normally has a little game based on the topic at hand. Mm. What are you thinking this week, Bopper? I'm not sure. I was thinking of like who is uh, talking to them in their head. 
Oh, yeah. Could be anyone. Could be a celebrity. Great. All right. Well, if I may kick it off, I'd love to thank from Three Hills in Canada, Jesse Malps. Jesse Malps uh, in the head. Ralph Malf from Happy Days. Ralph Malf? Ralph Malf, I think, is one of the characters. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the whole cast. The Fonz is there as oh, well. That would be... Cause there's the quite cast a lot of, of them. Happy Days. Yeah, the <laughs> cast of Happy Days. <laughs> and then when Ron Howard speaking, it would feel like Arrested Development. <laughs> yeah. Be You'd be like, oh my God, Arrested Development. No, <laughs> Happy yeah, Days. Yeah. <laughs> there's Henry Winkler. <laughs> hey. hey. Chachi. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, I'd also love to thank from Surrey, also in Canada... Michael Dio. Or in Michael's head, uh, Michael is hearing the voice of Sylvester Stallone, which sounds a little something like this. Hey, Michael, you should go and get a, get a slice of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that's good advice. I think I that's, lost that. That's good advice. I lost it a little bit that pizza. time. <laughs> I watched an interview with <laughs> Stallone recently. It was from way back, and he's talking very seriously about Rocky and how he really held off until... He was allowed to star in it. Like, the studio bought his script. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just really gambled on himself. Love it. Um, he's a, he's a hey, Michael, belief. you got to yeah. believe in yourself. He's right? like, oh, you don't, know what? This don't is- give in <laughs> for no one. Yeah, you'd want that guy in your head, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Finally from me, I'd love to thank from Fitzroy here in Melbourne, Australia, Nick Kavanagh. He's, well, Nick Kavanagh has... Uh, Mr. Ed. Whoa. Talking his head. Talking wow. horse. Yeah. You got a talking horse. You got a talking horse. So uh, peanut less, butter, gums and all. Yeah. When removed from the, the horse, it's slightly less impressive because it's just a voice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but if you know it's a horse. Yeah, if you know it's, that's right. And they probably talk about horsey things. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably like, oh, I'll go have an apple. Yeah. Well, Nick. <laughs> get me some hay. <laughs> hope you are having a good day. That's good. <laughs> uh, do you want to thank a few of these fine people? Dave or Jess? I would love to jump in. Go for it. Hey, let's give a big shout out from um, Midlothian oh. in Virginia in America, Kareem Rimawi. That's such a great name. That's Kareem, Kareem I'm sorry, one of my favorite names. Great name, isn't names. it? Kareem's lovely. It's a so really nice good. name. Rimawi. I'm sorry if I'm get, getting that wrong, but uh, from Midlothian, that's The obvious cool would be to say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who's oh, yes. got a great voice and would be... Um, yeah. It's one of the highest scorer of all time. Yeah. And Kareem's got to stick is Kareem together. Is Kareem the sky hook? Is that the signature move? Oh, yeah, popping it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, popping it up. Yeah. I don't know why I'm asking Dave. There's a basketballer in the room. D- yes. Also writes like not books and scripts and stuff. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar does it all. I believe, I think I was watching, um, have you seen Dave? It's a like a sort of a, a comedy about a... A rapper guy. And yeah, there was an episode where he was in it and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar oh, was I very funny. Very funny man. Awesome. I would also love to thank from uh, Gig Harbour. Very cool. In Washington, it is Joe Renkley. Joe Renkley is also a great name. Renkley. Okay. What about... Obviously, you'd love to get some uh, narration in your head from the greatest actor of their generation... Meryl Streep. Ooh. Could do it all. Could do it all. I wasn't like, sure if you're going to go Hel- Helen Mirren or, oh my God. or Meryl, Meryl Streep but I there. Think Meryl, most Academy Award nominations. And I think she'd be great because she does do different accents too. So you have, yeah. you, it'll be, she'd really mix it up. Have you you're like her Australian one? Yeah. Oh, good day. Oh, oh dear. No, the dingo took my old baby. <laughs> She's master, master I, of masterful. Master of accents. I actually think that um, we're wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meryl is right. Did make me Meryl's question right. it. We're and doing it wrong. We should be changing our accents immediately. Joe's got <laughs> Meryl going all all day long, and it is uh, exclusively the, the Aussie accent. <laughs> 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 and finally, I'd like to thank from uh, Raleigh in North Carolina. North Carolina. Quick fun fact about that. Do you know how most jurisdictions will have red fire engines? Yeah, yeah that's the colour of fire engines. Well, They're not in North Carolina. What? Yeah, they have blue fire engines. What kind of blue? Like a sky blue? An uh, electric blue? A red blue? A navy electric blue? Electric blue. <laughs> yeah, I think electric blue. Yeah. Probably. Uh, of course, Emmy Howell has Bruce McAvaney's voice. Emmy Howe. I'm not sure if I named the person yet, but big okay. shout out to Emmy Howe. Sorry, I paused after North Carolina. Do you want to do it again? 
No. Emmy, Great. We said, we said, Emmy, you're a legend. We I got to stop peeking over your shoulder, Dave. Love your support. Um, you are from you are from North Carolina. Does that give you any inspiration? Uh, yeah. Well, I was. I, I have already gone Bruce McAvaney, but oh. I think you're Emmy right. Emmy will have no idea who that is. Emmy won't know who Bruce McAvaney is. Which who, who's, great there, who's America's Bruce McAvaney? Uh, Nobody else has a McAvaney. What about John Chen? What a, no, John Chin? What's who's the, the guy from E.T.? What what um Bruce Buffer? Bruce Buffer. Let's know get ready is. to rumble. Yeah, let's oh. go Bruce Buffer. Possibly his brother is very motivating. Michael Buffer. Can't remember which is which. That would be really like that would be fun in your head. It's Mike, his brother Mike. They both do. Bruce does the UFC. Michael Buffer does. Let's get ready to rumble. Oh, awesome. That would be great to hear that all Ellen, wouldn't it? The Buffer brothers. The Buffers. You got the Buffer brothers in your yeah. head. Yeah. Yes, both. That's, that's yeah, great. Yeah, that's really John good. John Tesh is who I was thinking. I don't know how I got to John Chin, but anyway, John Tesh. I don't know who that is. Well, that's good that we've gone with. Who have we gone with? Uh, Bruce and Michael Br- Buffer. Bruce Buffer and Brothers. Michael, the Buffer Brothers. Buffer Brothers. Thanks, Emmy. Um, may I thank some people? That'd be fantastic. I would love to thank from Hamilton in New Zealand, Lee McIntosh. Ooh, Lee. Lee Mac, I think, yeah. is in <laughs> That'd be fun. a lot of quips. Hello, I'm Very Lee quick. Mac. Every day is a bonus. It's one of my favourite Lee Mac jokes. Um, a lot of fun. Great. Out Sorry, of context, can especially. I just ask, um, the voices yes. that Lee's hearing, is Lee Mac giving advice or just doing bits? He's doing bits. You just hear stand up from yeah, his Yeah, stand up bits. <laughs> you're hearing, that would be so annoying. You're hearing just his line from sketches. You're so right. there's long pauses and then Lee will say something. Oh, you're out for dinner trying to concentrate, meeting your partner's new parents. Yeah. New, pa- new, new partner's parents. He's getting the... Uh, partner's new parents. Yeah. I got some new ones. Yeah, I upgraded. Yeah. Singing the wrong lines from uh, California Dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> Very oh, funny All the leaves stuff. are brown. But only his bits. <laughs> so you're hearing like the wrong backup singing. <laughs> All the leaves are brown. That's very funny. All, All the, the leaves, leaves are brown. brown. <laughs> <laughs> <Great stuff. laughs> All the leaves are brown. Thank you, Lee McIntosh. I would also love to thank from Norwich, Great Britain, David Kingfisher. Oh, it feels like Norwich's most famous <laughs> oh, yeah, son. That's right. Has to be involved here. Uh, Alan Partridge. <laughs> Aha. <laughs> I'd love to hear him in there. I'm now. Alan Partridge. What, how did, what is it? From the Oast House. From the Oast But what does he say in the, the, original, the old talk show? Knowing me, no. knowing me, Alan Partridge, and knowing you, David Kingfisher. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I would love his voice in my head. That'd be fun. So Which good. you often do, pump into your head while you're while sleeping. I yeah. do, I've listened to a few of his uh, audio books twice now. So good. Just give that a listen. So thank you, David Kingfisher. And finally, I would love to thank from Brisbane, here in Queensland, Finn. Dawn French. Oh, great one. That would be great nice. Great one. Have you been looking at the bookshelf? Yes, I just looked at <laughs> Dawn French. And I, th- and I thought I'd like to have Dawn French in my head. Yeah, that would be a good one. In character as the Vicar of Dibley? Yes, exactly. And Exclusively. I think that might be the only character of hers I can think of. Is it's a big one. It's one of the big ones. It's one of the big four. Big four of French. I mean, very appropriate surname for today's episode. Beautiful. Oh, it all ties together. We're very good. Thank you very much, Finn, David, Lee, Emmy, Joe, Kareem, Nick, Michael, and Jesse. And the last thing we need to do is welcome a few people into our Triptych Mm. Club, which, of course, now has a... A dancer, don't we? Have a uh, Tom yeah. Quinder's uh, background dancing as well. So just picture that in your mind as well. Yeah. Uh, as we bring in, just uh, what have we got? Five inductees in the Triptych Club this week. So if you don't, if you're new to the Triptych Club, people have been uh, on the shout out level or above for three straight years. Get inducted into this club. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, spot in your mind and in your heart. And uh, I'm there at the door. I've got the velvet rope. I'm about to lift it. Might even be the Jeremy Swade rope this week. I lift it up <laughs> and that's, uh, that's fun. read your name off the <laughs> off the door list. Happy with that to be a permanent uh, <laughs> addition. <laughs> and uh, once you come in, Dave really bigs you up. He's your hype man. He's on the stage. Everyone else is already in the club. They're cheering you along. Jess is hyping up Dave because it takes a lot of energy to yeah. be a hype mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. Uh 
Jess, you normally have a cocktail. What's the Joan of Arc cocktail well, this week? Well, I mean, before I knew the topic, I was actually planning this cocktail, so it does feel a little in poor taste now because it is a flaming cocktail. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> but I just thought that would be kind of cool. I learned how to do that, and then I was like, yeah, cool, I'll take that. It's good. And now, I've, obviously, it feels... As soon as I said Joan of Arc, were you like, fuck? Yeah, a little bit. Fuck, I think she gets better. But I, I've been trying to send some emails while the report was being done, and I was like, I cannot get this menu changed in time. This is the opposite of Dave. Dave normally books a, 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 a like a nicely coincidental yeah. band. Dave, have you booked as a band this week? never going to believe it. Oh my God, who? I've actually booked Joan of Arc. The uh, Chicago band. Okay. Of course, they uh, indie rock band, they broke up last year, but they're reforming just for us, one night only. Yes. The Triptych Club has power. If you if you get a call from Dave, the booker of the Triptych yeah. Club, you, you answer, answer that call. <laughs> you never Oh, you answer. So we've got five inductees here. Are you ready to go? Dave, you ready to hype? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. So we've just got a flaming cocktail. We've got Joan of Arc. Everyone is absolutely pumped up. Let me hype you. Dave, can you just get the crowd going? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Let's just... uh... Let's hear. Can we get some noise out there? Yeah, that feels good. All right. All right. Hopefully none of this falls flat. (laughs) All right, firstly, from Miami. <laughs> Sorry, wrong button. <laughs> from Miami in Florida, United States, Grant M. Vitiznik. Oh, let me grant you entry to the club. Yes. Uh, from Leicester in Great Britain, it's Kieran Foster. Oh, let's foster a good vibe. <laughs> from Rockville in, I think, Maryland in the US, it's Insaniate. Rockville population, you. You rock. From West Sacramento, born and raised California, US, it's Betsy. Oh, you can bet on Betsy. Yes. And finally, from Akron, Ohio, I think it might be the first time I've said it nearly right in the US, it's Rachel <laughs> Leslie. Leslie. Less you is a bad time. Yeah. <laughs> but more you is a great time. Woo! Akron, Akron, however you say it, we love it. Welcome, Rachel, Betsy, Insignate, Kieran, Grant, Tommy and James. No, Tommy and James are last week. I've gone back too far. Hey, they're still here. Everyone's in the club. Everyone's That's true. Club. Shout out Can't to them leave. once again. Hey, let's go through them all. Alec, Christian, <laughs> Dylan, Ryan, Nick. Only joking. All right. So, <laughs> you know how I... Because, you know, the uh, whoever runs the... I think it's the Do Go On Quotes Twitter account or whatever it's called. Do Go On Wisdom. Oh, account. Do Go On Wisdom, yes. Yeah. Their pin tweet is like a picture thing to show you how to pronounce... Oh. And it's a, I think it's a Ren bird, and I forget what the, I think it's Akron, 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 Ohio, God's country either way. So welcome in everybody. That brings us to the end of the episode. What anything else we need to say just before we let people go? Um, just that you can suggest a topic over on our website, do go on pod dot com, or there'll be a link in the show notes. Um, you can uh, find us on socials at do go on pod, and you can email us do go on pod at gmail dot com. Nice one, absolutely. We'd love to hear from you. Dave, boot this baby home. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And we will be back with another week. Same time, same channel, brand new topic. But until then, I'll say thank you so much and goodbye. Later. Bye.